Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I congratulate you uh, for this international conference in questions and aspects of design. And all participants uh, from countries from far continents and, and also countries near to Latvia, everybody is welcome to participate in this beautiful brainstorm. Latvia wants to well, announce that we also are not in an empty place uh, in design because Latvian history of design do remember such famous names as Walter Zaps, inventor of the beautiful Wef Minox photo camera, the smallest size camera before the Second World War, designed in 1937. Uh, his counterpart and, and, and colleague Adolf Sirbite was in the factory enterprise WEF, a designer of airplanes, designer of cars, and designer of many radios uh, that time produced in Latvia. But even if we look, to, look today, our designer Valdis Chelms even touches questions and, and, and items uh, well seems far away from the material world because he designs ornaments of the dance festival where dancers are reproducing ornaments uh, on the stadium uh, in a size of 100, 200 meters and oriented to the spectators or uh, oriented to the sky. Today we may say that design covers many spheres of our life because there are designed medicine, there are designed cars, boots, and even airports. But of course we may say that robotics and artificial intellect uh, solves and helps uh, of humans to solve many problems. And uh, design, which today covers uh, very unique spheres of our life, uh, of course helps to rehabilitate our human capability and health uh, to move to recover our um, forces and uh, to help uh, our society to be healthy and to live a happy, uh, long life. What we may say uh, for this conference, uh, artificial intellect uh, is power of our life, of the 21st century, but also it um, colors our destiny for the future. And of course, uh, the idea of this conference today is to put the role of subject, the role of human under the debate. Where is the role and place of human in the mankind of 21st century? And of course, to seek answers on the question, where are the limits of coexistence of artificial intellect and humans? That's, I wish to all of you, innovative thinking, and not to forget the role of human on this beautiful world. So have a success in this creative and innovative discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, let us start the conference um, session number one, uh, Environment and Systems, the Individual and Power. And the first speaker is Beck Barnett from Australia with the future scenarios by design. Well, this will be a video. Please, video. Hi, everyone. My name is Beck Barnett. And today I'm going to be doing a short presentation on future scenarios by design. So I'm going to share my screen and get going. So I want to begin by acknowledging um, that I live, work, and play on the unceded sovereign land of the Yugambeh language group, part of the Bundjalung Nation. And I pay my respects to all First Nations people and their elders past, present, and emerging. So my name is Beck Barnett, and I am the co-director of Relative Creative. I'm a design strategist, a researcher, and a project manager. Um, and this is the rest of my team that you can see on the screen. Um, so I'm joined by Tristan Schultz, who co-directs with me and who founded Relative Creative uh, just over a decade ago. Paula Hardy, Mark Sayed, Naomi Hill, Mark Llewellyn, and Jilly, who's our studio doc. 
and we design communication strategies, experiences, and events that help people think, talk, and mobilize sustainable futures. We are an Indigenous-owned and led practice, and we're proudly informed by being on Yugan Bear Country here at Jullible, also known as Belly Heads, and also by Tristan Skimillory Heritage. So this is uh, an old picture, uh, we think probably early 1900s of Burley Heads, where I'm based. And this is Burley from a different angle um, and from much more recently. So you can see uh, the urban development that has happened here and spread out across the ocean front and the canals and creeks. So we're a very water-based city um, and surf culture is a really important part to the city's structure um, and also to the tourism that we have. We're also, we've, we've got more canals than Venice um, and so we're at high risk of sea level rise as a result of climate crisis. Um, and this is where we work from and the culture and place of of Burley Heads and the broader Gold Coast really does inform the work and the way we approach our work. So we're, we consider ourselves to be one of Australia's leading strategic design agencies um, and we work with all levels of government. So in Australia um, we have sort of three key levels of government. You've got um, your city councils and then the next step from that is your state or territory government. So for us that's the state of Queensland and then the next level up is the federal government or the Australian government. So we work with um, different departments and agencies at all levels. And uh, we connect, experiment, facilitate and share our design, research and strategies through meaningful collaboration with community advocates, social enterprises, scientists, policymakers, planners, the business sector, universities and various other like-minded companies, organisations and institutions. We're a passionate and interdisciplinary design studio and we've got expertise in visual communication design, service design, product design, experience design, events, workshops, exhibition design, participatory design, policy and planning design, design-led facilitation, public art, critical research, public speaking and design, um, design writing. And this is all embedded in strategic foresight and systemic design theories, methods and practices. We're really serious uh, about social responsibility, sustainability, social justice and equity, and our practice exists within these contexts as relative to just transitions in a green new world. Um, but we also recognise that um, the way we practice and the way that we are able to practice is quite unique to our situation um, as citizens of Australia um, and the way that our government operates, um, which isn't necessarily always positive um, and, and we generally are quite critical of uh, particularly our federal government but um, it, we, we are working in a space where we are able to be critical of the government as well and we recognise our privilege within that. So I really wanted to begin by introducing um, a few of our projects to give you a bit of an idea of what we do. And then I wanted to talk about um, kind of um, projects that we lead so they're not dictated by clients at all um, and talk about how we use them to leverage new conversations and actions and um, getting the people in our immediate community to really start thinking and acting on um, and mobilising these just transitions that we so urgently need. Uh, so if you go to our website, uh, relativecreative.com.au, you can see that we have quite a broad range of different projects that we work on. Um, so anything from um, branding and identity, so the more um, kind of straightforward visual communication design, uh, which we try and always work with uh, like-minded companies and organisations with, all the way through to um, much more strategic design, um, such as creating a placemaking and identity for a 
local location name to the spit. So this was a big project that we undertook at the beginning of the year, and it was for the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. And they really needed a new way to be able to communicate the water planning process to people across Queensland. So Queensland is a huge state um, that has a real diversity of um, the sort of work that people are doing um, from the south all the way up to the north. Um, so the southeast of Queensland is generally considered uh, more populated and uh, sort of more city focused. So um, you have all of the industries that go alongside that. Um, and then as you move north, um, it's much less populated. So you've got less people, um, but you're also seeing other industries come into play. So uh, much more manufacturing, but also um, industries like mining um, and farming as well. So it was necessary to be able to communicate water plans and the water planning process um, to everyone across Queensland um, and also to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, that are really integral to the water planning process um, because one of the things that is considered as Queensland plans water use is um, the need for cultural water use and what that means and um, how much water is being allocated to that specific use um, and also how much water is being allocated to the environment and further from that um, then how it can get allocated to industry, agriculture and urban use. Um, so uh, they've updated the way they approach water planning um, based on uh, the data and modelling um, looking at the impact that climate change is going to have on water availability. Um, and it was really important to be able to communicate that um, in an interesting way, but also in a way that helped people understand the process that was happening and who was involved in that process. So we did this project in partnership with um, a company called Water Technology. And um, we really thought about how each step of the water planning process could be communicated, um, what sort of imagery could be repeated across that, um, and how to make something quite complex um, communicated in an interesting way, but also in a factual way. So making sure that um, we were really telling um, the general public as well as industry about the impact that climate is going to have on uh, the way we plan our water usage. So there's a couple of examples of the infographics that we designed for that particular project. So like I said, that project was working with the Queensland government um, and they were interested in our strategic insight into the way we should be talking about things like climate change um, as, as much as they were about our ability to um, visually communicate these really significant things. Another major project that we're working on at the moment, um, and actually this is an example of working with an international government, um, so we're working with the government of the Kingdom of Tonga for, for this project, is the development of a national long-term low greenhouse gas emissions development strategy. Uh, so this project, we started at the end of 2019 and we were all set to travel to Tonga and run a series of workshops, um, really understanding the visions um, that the Tongan people have for their uh, low emissions development strategy um, and how they want to achieve that and uh, how they might be able to achieve that and creating pathways to get there. Um, all to be presented at COP26. Um, but COVID-19 threw a little bit of a spanner in the works of that. Um, so we had to dramatically shift how we were organizing and planning all of these events um, and move it into an online space. So while the people who have participated in the workshop 
in Tonga were able to do that in person, we were facilitating remotely, um, which has been a really interesting process. And um, we believe we've been achieving it quite successfully to date. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really changed the way that we conduct our practice and the way that we think about um, how we can engage um, and run meaningful workshops, even if we can't actually be there in person. Uh, so to do this particular workshop, we designed um, the visual communication design elements were designed working closely with the Tongan team. Um, and we adapted our particular form of mapping, which I'm going to explain a little bit later on, um, into something that would work for the Tongan context um, and that we could step participants through remotely. And that is me participating in that workshop. So it's going to be really interesting to see how um, that takes shape over the coming months as we um, kind of step through that workshop process. And again, really exciting that the government um, of Tonga is kind of so forward thinking in this process um, and really exciting as a design team to be part of uh, this project and um, kind of really being key to developing the strategy for that process. And the third project that I want to talk about um, or give you a brief overview of is um, working with Brisbane City Council, which is a local council, um, not our council, but a neighbouring one, uh, on the future BNE project. So this project has taken place over the last five, four years, five years. Um, we've run five different sessions, so since 2016. Um, and from 2016 to 2019, we ran that in person, live. Um, so we designed these um, sort of three hour workshops for between 400 and 600 kids each year um, and stepped them through a design process um, that really helped them engage with, with and unpack an understanding of water security and then um, with that knowledge that had kind of been rapidly downloaded to them, uh, be able to design and think of radical ideas to secure Brisbane's water future. So I, you'll notice that I've mentioned water a lot um, and I guess acknowledging that uh, where we're based in southeast Queensland, we're kind of under threat um, from water in two different ways. So firstly, through sea level rise and the impact that will have on our coastline um, and recognising that um, the majority of our housing um, is based along the coastline. Um, but also uh, we regularly suffer quite severe droughts, which um, has an impact not only on our agriculture um, and our ability to produce food and farm, but also on the amount of water that we're able to use um, so we quite often um, have some level of water restriction in place around what we can use water for. Um, and then during those more se severe droughts, we've had limits um, on our water use. So uh, the future BNE project developed off the back of the millennial drought, uh, where Southeast Queensland reduced their daily water use from about 360 litres per day to 120 litres per day. So the Future B&E project was really about getting students to think um, beyond those kind of individual changes towards more systemic change um, that they could um, see implemented within their lifetime to dramatically change our relationship with water while also embedding um, or reaffirming some of those um, kind of drought-based water preservation techniques that they'd have been growing up with um, so things like um, reducing shower time, um, thinking about um, how much water is going down the tap um, and through to thinking about how we could adopt shifts in our diets um, to reduce the amount of water required for agriculture, um, but also in terms of how much water is being used in the cooking process and things like that. Um, 
embracing the water uh, surrounding Brisbane to the Brisbane River um, as a means of transport, um, all of those sorts of things and really framing that for students to think about from a number of different perspectives. So globally and locally, um, during flood and drought, as we experience both, um, thinking about both technology, but also the human um, and so on. So that's how that project evolved, um, sort of between 2016 to 2020. In 2020, we were invited um, to transition the project from being run in a large event. Um, and this was actually pre-COVID, but we did it just in time, which was exciting. So being transitioned uh, from being kind of a large scale one day event that happened annually to being an event um, that environmental centres in Brisbane could run in schools uh, with a number of classes in school um, and do that multiple times a year. So we redesigned um, all of the collateral so that it could be reused. Um, but we also um, kind of had to slightly adapt the running of the session, knowing that we weren't going to be there and then train other people to be able to run that. So that was a really exciting transition um, for that project away from something that we were kind of um, doing every year to being able to package it up and hand that over for the council to run throughout the year. And finally, um, I really want to talk about our Gold Coast City Futures project. So this is something that we run ourselves um, from more of a design lab practice, uh, design lab perspective, pardon me. So really thinking um, about all of the research uh, that we're doing throughout the year and how we engage the local community around that and the urgency of um, having a just transition to a green new world, but um, actually being able to inspire the local community to imagine that um, collectively and then have the scope and space to be able to act on and implement some of those changes um, that, that we start talking about. So this is the second year that we've run that. We ran it for the first time in 2019 um, and we run it so the 2019 event was focused on the whole of the Gold Coast um, and there's some stats up on the screen there about the Gold Coast. So it's the sixth largest city in Australia and one of the fastest developing regions. Um, our population is going to grow considerably by 2031. Um, the amount of transport uh, trips taken will obviously increase in that time. Um, sea level rise, we're seeing predictions of between 60 and 110 centimetres by 2100, and they're quite conservative ones. Um, where last year we started to really see the reality um, of what, what we mean when we say high fire weather danger days and a longer fire season. So um, last year we had fires um, start in September, which is the end of winter, early spring for us. Um, and they were quite devastating in the hinterland around the Gold Coast and the Gold Coast itself was blanketed in smoke um, for days. Uh, and that I think that really brought home to a lot of people um, how this fire risk is going to keep increasing and what the consequences of that are like. Um, and then, of course, following that, the rest of Australia burned um, pretty much until mid-January when we then went into a major flood event in many places and then following that um, into the COVID crisis. So, um, we, yeah, we're living in this situation where we're both facing um, impact from rising sea levels, but also from those higher, higher fire weather danger days. And, um, yeah, we actually saw parts of the rainforest burn last year that have never burnt before and shouldn't be burning. Um, they're just so dry. We're, um, we'll also see risks to coastal development. Um, and then obviously the statistic that uh, we're likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052. And actually, I think um, since we created 
that little information pack that has, figures being revised and we're going to be getting there a lot faster. So to approach this um, project, we really took um, our mapping process that um, Tristan's been really integral in developing over the last few years um, and focused his PhD on. Um, so we've taken that and our, how we approach that and steps that we go through with that um, to developing an engaging uh, forum and for the 2019 forum that happened over two days. Um, so this is a digitized version of that, um, but we begin with the yarning process, um, understand uh, the, the present, um, the past and connect them. And then we start thinking about the current direction that we're heading if nothing changes. We also think about the futures that are arriving. So they're, they're the futures that we can't do anything about. So there's a certain level of climate change that we put in play. There's particular changes to demographics that are put in play, such as aging populations um, and moving populations as a result of um, changes in climate um, and how they clash. And that sets a really fertile ground for helping people to think about their preferred futures. So these are utopic visions. Um, they're actually grounded in dealing with the things that are arriving. So this is a very old picture of what that mapping process looks like um, when we uh, go through that full process um, in, in the particular way shown here. So when we're mapping that wall onto a piece of butcher's paper and trying to capture all of those movements over time um, and really plot out a preferred direction, a preferred future. And this is what that looked like over the few days um, in 2019. So we began with a yarning circle. Um, so also just to note, this was at the end of October last year. So pre, very much pre-COVID, uh, which is why everyone's sitting close so close together. We've run a couple of in-person yarning circles um, since COVID and um, we've had to space people much further apart than this, which uh, doesn't quite have the same effect. But this process really allows for um, people to speak um, from their perspectives and share and for a listening process to happen. Um, and it readjusts any hierarchy imbalances within the room as well. From there, we undertook a process, um, a visual dialogue process, which has been adapted from work that Professor Norman Sheehan's done. And this really starts people, sets people in um, the right frame of mind to really think divergently um, and kind of open up to different approaches and be spatially situated within the workshop itself and with the group of people that they're with. So this process um, ended up taking the shape of a stingray, which is a significant animal here on the Gold Coast. And that really helped frame the next two days of conversation. Um, and people were working on these large format um, worksheets in groups. So there was constant dialogue, um, there was provoc provocation questions, um, and people were really mapping out their understanding of uh, the threat that we were experiencing um, alongside information from what the council's actually doing about it, which is not very much. Um, and then alongside other research and information around um, alternatives. So the focus is, um, in this, in 2019, we're on um, just transitions and green urbanism, restorative and regenerative economy, uh, agroecology and food, politics and power, transport, forced migration and recreational, civic and natural water. And we had a range of people from the local council, um, local universities and the creative community attend.
And through that process, uh, we really mapped out um, different ideas around um, new approaches that we can envision. And then we started capturing that uh, in design fictions. So telling stories about these futures um, that we could then use as a way to begin designing back. So what actions need to be put in place now, um, digging where we stand to begin a process of change and begin, begin that just transition on the Gold Coast because we definitely, we definitely weren't there in 2019 and we're still not there in 2020. So that's what um, the mapping out for these um, steps towards just transitions look like. So the three key proposals ended up being a tool library, uh, which we actually now have on the Gold Coast, um, a zine that would share um, sort of significant information and start um, this community-led conversation um, and make sure that oh, it's maintained consistently while also sharing um, kind of new information and conversations around things like the four-day work week, um, cohabiting, co-ops and shared wealth and really discussing them um, in a different way and one that we're perhaps unfamiliar with being discussed kind of openly on the Gold Coast. Um, and then life zones. So this was uh, probably the longest term proposal. I was really thinking about um, what we create in the spaces that are left when we take into account sea level rise and bushfire risk and how we keep a city of people safe, um, but also prepared to move in those events. Um, and through that, also preserving these natural ecologies and maintaining them as safe spaces. And this was all put together into a report, um, capturing all of, all of that work and, and giving that back to everyone who participated so that they could really track the journey that they'd been on, the recommendations that were being made um, and be able to take next steps if they wanted to um, without relative creative. So 2020, um, we were aware that we'd be unlikely to run a similar event. Or, and if we did that, we'd have to be really um, conscious of how close people were getting together, how many people were in the space um, and what all of that looked like, uh, which would really transform the way that we Kind of normally run workshops and engagements um, and in the end we decided uh, not to run an in-person engagement and to instead find new ways uh, that both managed having people do things in person um, and the potential that the online sphere offers so this year we decided also that um, we wanted to include a much broader variety of the citizenship of the local area um, so be much more community focused um, while still layering in um, the expertise and expert knowledge that is really vital that people engage with and understand. Um, and we also wanted to focus specifically on the area of the Gold Coast that we're based, so Burley Heads, um, because we felt that while 2019 provided a really good overview of the sorts of futures the city was facing and the sorts of futures the city could have, um, it was hard for people to pin down exact and precise actions because it was such a large area that they were kind of envisioning. So we picked one suburb um, to focus on and we reframed the topics from 2019 um, to food, culture, living, moving and visiting. And uh, we created a series of cultural probe kits to send out to the local community. So that's what's pictured here, which included a map of the area, stickers to mark out significant places and with prompts for doing that. A postcard, uh, which had the prompt, the year is 2050, um, and then whichever theme, so moving in Burley is, to inspire people to really think about what that future might be and what they envision for that future. And a camera for people to document significant parts of um, the suburb or significant moments that they wanted to share. 
We also captured, interviewed a, a few locals um, and captured their thoughts about the future and have shared them um, on our platforms as well. And we wanted to do that because we recognised that not everyone was going to have the time to complete a cultural probe kit. So it was another way to engage with people um, and to also make it more people focused. So um, these are all people that you might bump into in the street um, that many people would potentially be familiar with um, through going about their everyday lives um, and getting kind of getting thoughts around the future from just those everyday community members. And then we're putting that all together. This is um, just a bit of a mock-up at the moment because that it's still in production. But we're going to be putting that all together into a kiosk of the future. Um, and this will be down um, at Bleach, which is our, our local festival here, local arts festival here, um, in a couple of weeks. And as well as being a bit of an arts installation to really provoke people into asking questions and thinking about the future, um, people can also engage with and interact um, and see some of those proposals made by people who've completed the cultural pro kits. They can write their own postcards to the future um, and they can rearrange some of those elements um, that have been proposed by others to create their own visions of early futures. So really aimed at kind of capturing, uh, well, firstly, really emphasizing the need to talk about the future and the sorts of futures that we want to have, layering into that the importance of just transitions. So we're not just talking about any future, we're talking about a future that responds to the climate crisis, um, that decolonizes, that addresses um, some of these un really unique threats that we're facing, particularly here, uh, but also lessens our impact globally. Um, so inspiring those conversations, showing how those conversations can happen, and then trying to capture those conversations uh, finally in a zine at the end, uh, which will make recommendations based on um, those vision, future visions that people have. So um, how do we get to those? Um, what are people asking for? What are the next steps? What are steps people can take individually, but also what steps need to happen um, more systemically and how do we um, as citizens of a place uh, create that systemic change that we need to see. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, and I hope you're all having a fantastic conference. Bye. The books are a compilation of essays. Uh, one is edited by Jeff Malpas, Living in Tasmania, I would argue the most important thinker of the place at the moment in the world. And other one is a collection of essays called Design Philosophy Reader, edited by Anne-Marie Willis. But first of all, in order to design, we need to see the world as design, quoting my teacher, Tony Fry. And this conference and the, the way how we are holding this conference, I believe strongly supports this pretty bold argument and statement. Everything that allows for us to talk at the moment, and I really hope that you can hear me and see me, is there by design. Take a look around you and try not to name everything that is designed around you, around the place you are at the moment, but try to name something that's not designed. One would argue the air in the room, no, it's air conditioned. It's ventilated, it's artificial in a way. The lightning, of course, it comes from the lamps. Uh, the, the greenery, the plants in a corner of the, of, the, of the hall, I strongly believe that they are bred from hybridized seeds in laboratory. The world within the world we humans inhabit are by design. In a sense, we people are here by design. So what is place? Place is topos, as ancient Greeks stated it, and they used the word place, not space. Space in, in ancient Greek is, uh, the word space comes from uh, stadium. The stadium actually was a place where people did, did sports, and stadium was also a measurement piece. 
then later Romans took the stadium and named it Spatium. And from that, the word space emerged. But for Greeks, the, the most quintessentially important, the most fundamental word they used to describe the environment they are in was topos, was place. They used locus as well as a site, as a site where things happen, as a site of making. Plato philosopher used name Kora, the where outside the city's borders, the area, the interval, the liminal space, the Kora where actually things takes place, where beings come into the place. Because you need to be in Kora to see the city. You need to be in Kora to see the forest. And when you are not either in forest or in the city, you are in a Kora, in this creative environment. Truth be told, and this comes from my both research and professional experience, and also it's grounded in theories, but I won't be bothering you with uh, lots of books and quotations. We are in a position where place has lost its place. The place has become just a point in space, a spatial reduction that we can describe with X, Y, Z. And for that, we can thank a guy called René Descartes. And what he did, he just brought together uh, geometry and mathematics. And in that particular moment, the environment around us first became mathematically structurable. It became equation. Therefore, everything you need to understand about the environment, the space we're living in, you can do by mathematics. And in that particular moment in time, the place lost its meaning and it just became space plus something else. And here I am quoting Jeff Malpas, who is a huge criticist of the thinking that you just add something to the space and you get a place. You add some style, you add some, uh, I don't know, branding and it becomes place. But if we are thinking about place just as spatial reduction, we are losing the essence of place. For me, the place is event of gathering, event of environmental gathering. For me, place is topographically logical event of gathering characterized by the environmental elements such as space, landscape, borders, limits, edges, sentiences, sentience, history and history, skills, care, time, atmosphere, coming from Greek, atmos, connections, sensory composition and formulation. We think through places. Our consciousness is completely topographically, logically embodied within the environment. It is through the places we experience time and space. Place is not something reduced. Place is where we experience time and space, our space-time continuum. Our reality is being brought into existence and what we experience here and now through the places. Place, when understood from the design perspective, goes beyond as uh, goes beyond as spatial reduction, meaning only location. House is space, home is a place. And when I'm talking about and I'm doing placemaking, when I'm doing in one of the design projects, I bring design to the place within this thinking of place. Place brings together, place holds together, place also binds together. Of course, you can tell the same about the space. But really, think about your memories. Think about the memories and think about smell. Think about what really constitutes your memory about visiting your grandparents. What really constitutes your experience when you go into the garden? There are three very interesting things about place which differentiates place from the space. First of all is the spirit of the place, the genius loci, the guarding spiritus, something that gives somewhere a place a distinctive identity, the feeling of the place, its atmosphere. And of course you can talk about sense of the place, what you feel there, how the place itself feels. And for Romans, for Romans, the genius loci, that additional 
weird, not even weird, but additional element, the structuring force of the place was Genius Loci, the spirit that guarded a place. There fundamentally every people deep within heart and mind understands that place is something more than space. It is not just the sum of the spatial aspects, it's the wholeness of our experience. Yet there are paradox with the place. You can't touch it and place always escapes. And this is the question I asked, I think, two years ago uh, and on Twitter. And this is what people answered. Identity of place is more about temporal content. Something that we experience there. I'm not trying to make place or bring place away from space. I just want to, for for all of us to think or ret return to thinking of the place. So what happens when we talk about place and what happens when we bring design to it? This happens. This is the scheme I've been working on for a while and this is the way it's it's still in development. I believe this year has proven to us that if we say we have answers, we are lying to ourselves. This is basically, this is the way how I'm questioning the place, not answering what a place is, but how I'm questioning what place could be if we see, see or think about place through the lens of design. Therefore, the visualization of place as event of environmental element gathering. Of course, place consists of space. Of course, place consists of landscape. But what is landscape? Landscape is objective reality or scenery of our experience. It is relationship in between elements at different scales every second. Of course, place is constituted by borders, and especially in thinking of Aristotle, the borders where one thing becomes other is incredibly important. And when I think about it, when I work on design projects for places, I start to think about place not from the center, but from the edge. And of course, places are constituted by the limits, both spatial and both temporal. And this is the simple part. Design and architecture are incredibly effective to work with places from the spatial uh, side, I would say, the spatial dimension. But what happens when we bring such things as atmosphere, skills, care and time to the place? How can we design place or even try to design place? Nevertheless, that we know that place is maybe something completely undesignable. Because place is what designs, not we design places. I will just shortly go through how I perceive or how I approach all these elements when working in design projects. Informed by thinking and doing design. Space, as I said, we are incredibly effective in space. This is uh, what you see basically is uh, is fundamental basis of every given designing uh, software. Naming, for example, SketchUp as well. You open a software which translates environment into the three dimensional space with X, Y and Z. Nevertheless, actually interesting part is that the ancient Greeks had the fourth dimension and it was a depth. But how do you design landscape? How do you design relationships in between elements? By keeping in mind that landscape changes throughout the year. That you must design according to change within a change. Landscape is ever changing environment, ever changing experience of our sensory senses. It's very, very easy to design borders where one place ends and other uh, begins. The interesting thing about borders, borders do not divide, borders connect. And when you design from the perspective that borders connect, and here as well I'm quoting Jeff Malpas who is criticizing Donald Trump, because by building a wall on a Mexico-American border, the people will stick to the wall, not vice versa. Borders constitutes places. And when you design from the border, not the center, and from the border as a connecting force, things change. 
And for the purpose, I used the image of a Burning Man Festival in USA. The borders here in this image constitute our perception of the place. Unfortunately, these are the borders we are incredibly effective making in. Though the interesting thing is that borders in the natural environment, though the question begs to be asked, what is natural environment in these days? Borders seems to be, from the perspective of biological diversity, the most rich in species. Borders not, are not always bad. Then, of course, there are limits from Lehman, from Lemus. Uh, ancient Romans called uh, Lemus, Lehman, uh, the, the outer border of uh, Roman Empire, where civilization ends and barbaric tribes begins. Limits can be seen as uh, the edge of our capacity, where our effectiveness to operate stops. Limits can be seen as edges, sometimes bad, sometimes uh, can be seen as an obstacle. But limits can also be seen as something that provides you everything you need. This is the way how I approach designing limits or designing within limits when working on environmental design projects. Not to understand what we have, but to understand what we don't have, what we are missing, what goes under the radar. To work with the things we don't have in order to get them. And I'm using this uh, imagery of a uh, Mongolian tribe because for them, the, this yurta, this, this home, this place is limited spatially though it's absolutely limitless within the landscape. And this is the, the million dollar question. Time. Time can be seen as measurement, but then it's, uh, I think it's very, very uh, limited approach how to think about time. Time can be seen also as a medium as a place as where things change. Therefore, when working on placemaking projects, one is to work with the spatial elements and to design in space, to design for landscape, as landscape, by landscape. But it's also important to design in time. And design in time names two things. First, design as it is located in the time we are in, designing in recognition of time designing of recognition of limited our time and limitless global time. And second, to design in time, responding in a time frame that reflects the urgency in which we need to respond to some of the major crises facing us. How to design care? That's why I'm using uh, the saying not to take care, but to make care. How to design place which designs care? how to make a place which provides care. And we can talk about hospitals, we can talk about hotels, and we can talk about schools as well. And especially in this year where we need to completely re-transform the way how we perceive education, maybe this way of thinking can inform some sort of effective way of uh, doing design. How to design place which designs care, which makes care. Because where care happens, there are skills can be brought into the existence. Constructive skills and cultivating skills. The skills we need for this place to be made or the skills that can be made within this place. And the aspect of care and skills are fundamental to the placemaking, in my opinion. And this is an image without definition or description. I believe it's just, it's just a beautiful image. And last but not the least, the atmosphere. I don't agree that atmosphere comes from the styling. Therefore, I don't believe that atmosphere is something that spatiality or space brings in. Though I completely agree that atmosphere might be the most important aspect of place. How to design atmosphere? How to design this Greek atmos? the vapor, the breath 
that breathes within the place, the breath of Genius Loci, the breath of that guarding force that inhabits the place. I believe it's impossible to design atmosphere, but I believe and I strongly support the idea that when you work critically with each of the elements, then you can make a conditions or condition for that guarding spirit, that Genius Loci, to come in. Therefore, when designing places for us, we should always be designing places for others. And this is where design becomes place. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, if I haven't received any feedback, then I will start, hopefully, that uh, I'm visible and also you can see my presentation. Um, luckily, we are all uh, used to this remote working, so I'm only one uh, presenter in this conference hall. And uh, yeah, my name is uh, Ali Turlaya. And today I will speak more about praxis of the urban environment and communities, especially after Jan Stines, who is uh, my urban colleague, I would say, uh, who delves into the subject in depth. Um, I have also, uh, also Janis has personal and, and hands-on experience and uh, me too. So, since I have 20 minutes, uh, it's quite a lot. I would use uh, this time also to start from the very beginnings, uh, especially about my personal connections to this subject. And, um, We'll start for, from some milestones. Um, uh, I have some milestones, uh, my personal mind, milestones in the subject uh, dates back to 2009 when I did my MA studies in arts and cultural management in the UK. Another milestone is uh, Riga 2014, European Capital of Culture, and of course, milestone where we are now is this special year. And at the time, when I was in the UK, uh, the city of Liverpool was celebrating the title of European Capital of Culture. And the words culture, city, communities, and regeneration were total buzzwords especially regeneration, the subject I'm working quite much now. And uh, while studying, I chose to do one of my term papers on the subject of social regeneration. And for this case study, I chose one small community in England's coastal town where some iconic modernist building was restored as an art center. I wanted to explore a uh, described uh, Bil this kind of Bilbao effect on this small town. And uh, when I didn't get the answer I was expecting, uh, I came back with even more questions. And these questions were, oh, you can see my notes, fantastic. Oh, no, you cannot. <laughs> so the questions were, what are the crucial substances what makes the city a better place to live? Another question was, what kind of relationships are required between stakeholders in this process? What is the role of community in all of this? And how much time is needed to measure the real econ economical value? Also the subject I'm also very interested in. Shortly after uh, Riga was announced to be European capital of culture, it was 2010. I didn't know how or when, but I clearly knew I wanted to be part of it. To wrap up shortly, the European capital of culture, I should say that 
Riga 2014 as a happening or event or a process didn't leave us, I mean, the city of Riga with uh, some kind of newly built contemporary art center or any other big cultural institution or structures. Uh, Riga 2014 also didn't leave us with a clear plan for the cultural funding or even a plan to support the community work. But Riga 2014 did leave us, or at least me, uh, our relationships, the network, and that little feeling that the city is our common project with our own little roles in it. When I talk about the space, I usually show this image. Um, actually, Janis Tienes has participated in a lower image making um, about the mental, social, social and physical space. And I truly agree what Janis just said, that we think through the space. And also during the European Capital of Culture, how I see it, the space became a crucial subject in uh, many disciplines, like space for art, the quality of public space, the empty spaces, community spaces. And since that time, it was 2012, we founded the uh, Sarkandago Neighborhood Association. It was neighborhood uh, movement and I still live in this neighborhood, and we were constantly thinking how to improve the mental space of this space. Basically, the inside image was much better than, when the, uh, than the outside image, but the outside image truly affected how the local people thought about the space, so I had a feeling that the care about the space is limited. And one of the main work for me and my community became transforming the external image of my neighborhood. And we strongly advocated for neglected public spaces, especially. Uh, I should note and say that the country were just 30 years ago gathering together in a public, in a public space was considered as an act against the ruling system open, inviting, and good equipped or designed public spaces is something what is still greatly missing in our neighborhoods. And in my humble opinion, Riga 2014 became some sort of platform and acted as a launchpad for many different collaborations. It also created the opportunity to break down the boundaries uh, of the city happenings, both mentally and physically. It somehow became finally legit to do things, create multi-ties, sh share the experiences and the values, create networks, trying to experiment with the space, which by the way, we haven't still learned and we are still afraid of as a city. It was also when something contemporary really happened in the neighborhoods. These happenings and actions um, prove that instead of being margins of cultural life or margins of any kind of life, neighborhoods are as important for the image of the city as postcard Riga Old Town. Altogether, it all helped to be a little more patriotic and feeling more connected with the place you live in which was uh, also a very important uh, aspect in community work, which also acts as a base for forming an important stakeholder for the city, because city needs its inhabitants, and city needs its inhabitants with some values and opinion. So the image you see here Uh, is a pocket square in my neighborhood, if we talk about this physical space now, which was um, planned to be a pilot project before European Capital of Culture. And after this year finished, it is only tangible thing what remained. 
Uh, the project was initiated and led by several NGOs involving the local community into planning, negotiating, and implementing the features in this public space. Yes, the crucial part in that was where the inhabitants, and this is how I see the process the cities should do. Before making some space, they should ask their, their people what, who live there and who would experience this uh, space, how are they going to see it or how are they going to use it. We went through this, through this project as an NGO, as a independent NGOs. And uh, talking about the social space, we also uh, created um, tools and opportunity for people to participate in making the space. This is image actually from the third year of birthday of the square, which we organized as the community to repaint the walls, because after some use and tear, of course, it needed to be repainted. Um, Talking about the mental space or how we provided a significant um, uh, image of this uh, uh, space and uh, representation and actually as a landmark, I would say, is that only those who really know about history or maybe delved into the neighborhood's uh, past would discover that the type found and the way how represented the identity of the uh, the pocket square, which didn't have a name before, is from the former rubber factory uh, of the 19th century, which is still is kind of effective and working in the neighborhood. So this is one example how you could use the knowledge and some traditions or maybe forgotten traditions to renew some traditions. Uh, I wouldn't go deeper into this project itself, but uh, the building process uh, revealed shortcomings uh, within the coordination between various city departments, including the organization of ECOG. I counted the uh, 11 stakeholders which were involved into delivering this bureaucracy uh, for this specific project. In short, we had the money from ECOC, but the rest was upon us. The organization trusted us completely to, to deliver this project as part of the program, but the process, I, but in the process, I had false expectations that the city needed it. There was also no clarity about what will happen after, who would take care about the space later. Of course, everything ended good and uh, now the janitors are from the city park administration, and but refreshing this red paint or, or, or the elements in the, and the future vision of the square is on us, the community. And very fresh news, just yesterday uh, I got uh, news that our project to renew the square has been accepted and will be accomplished in next year's time, which is uh, very good news for our community in Sarkan Daugava. Talking about physical space, this is also another example how communities sometimes are faster than the city. Because actually the space is very is organized very centrally and usually is not flexible enough in order to make fast decisions or or improvements. So actually neighborhood activists and organizations are taking uh, uh, responsibility and, and, and doing it just faster and with their own resources. Uh, some neighborhoods go even further. For example, this uh, project was included in a public uh, budgeting, a uh, participatory budgeting uh, pilot project last year, uh, which is Agenskalns um, Square uh, before the market, market square. And they even uh, produced a um, kind of a competition between uh, artists about what kind of elements they would include in this square. The, 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 the whole process was led by the inhabitants of the, of the place, not the city.
another example of neighborhood activism and how the mental space is created. For example, this neighborhood organization, uh, Czechor Counts, or the Cone Hill in English, is using the local artist's work in order to produce the yearly calendar, selling it, and uh, that's how promoting the, the, the image of the place or space, because in watercolors it definitely looks sometimes much better than in the reality. The same organization is also doing some tactical urbanism, proving that safety matters, although this lines has been removed next day after they have been painted by the city authorities, the need is still actual. It, it is still needed to do something about it. So it's another example of how you can intrude with the space or, or, or make connections with the place. Here in my neighborhood, for example, we are planting sunflowers in order to remind the city that the regeneration of forgotten waterfronts are still our priority and we haven't forgot it. This is kind of really uh, not loud movement, but it is very important for us that we still keep this li uh, live in between uh, neighborhoods, people. If five years nobody believed us that it's possible, now th I, I hear around that people want this uh, old river to be restored. But it took us like five or till seven years to, to kind of make this mental space. And talking about representation and since European Capital of Culture finished, but we went further together with another 10 neighborhood um, organizations, we founded uh, Riga Neighborhood Alliance where we wanted to say to the city that this gap that we are filling uh, is okay, but it's not sustainable if we keep this uh, just between us and the citizens. And we constantly reminded the city that all what we want is that before, de before decisions are made, uh, we want to be heard and uh, the people in the neighborhoods should be heard. The most challenging thing is also that we know that if we can act fast and do something uh, quite easily, that experiments for the city are still very uh, new or, or the process which city is constantly afraid of like improving the bicycle infrastructure. What concerns the big areas in Riga with the high rises and um, let's say block neighborhoods, it's very difficult to make uh, communities there. And um, one of the reasons that we discovered during a uh, Riga Neighborhood Alliance is that these kind of places are not usually considered as a place you want to actually stop or make your, make your roots. Because as soon as you would have money, you would probably disappear from the city somewhere in the meadows or next to Riga. And this is like what we see in reality in the statistics that the donut is getting bigger, but the middle is difficult uh, to, to, to fill in. This is, for example, neighborhood of Portsiams, which could be the fourth largest city in Latvia, actually. What we did this year uh, with the Reagan Neighborhood Alliance, we gathered local inhabitants and we talked about a concrete space within this neighborhood. And actually, with good results, what we what we uh, gathered is that people actually want identity, they want more greenery, they want more pedestrian crossings and so forth, no normal things. So we have a lot of spaces in Riga which need some kind of bigger attention 
and there is the big need and we st somehow still f f feel that uh, nobody hears us. And we have now the situation that regions and the cities will compete with, it, with each other exactly because of citizens. And I think that we must stop being afraid of people, finally. Citizens' loyalty will benefit city administration, while demotivated and sluggish citizens will continue to harm society. In, in particular, cities need to be allowed to experiment more and look for the new ways to how to work together and to make the best decisions that are, that are important to their citizens. In addition to the financial and responsibility goals, we must pursue some quality of life goals as well. Because hearing people gives various indirect benefits. There is less anger in the society and it means more pleasant human environment. And we cons consciously also choose to be in the places where it's pleasant, right? So that's it for me. And um, yes, stay at good health and not do not be afraid to experiment. Thank you very much. I can have only applause from the Viestors, which is here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, so if, I don't know how to see the question here, but uh, probably, yes. Is there any questions or, but I don't know where to see them. Hello, my name is Viestor Stelmans. I'm a uh, planner. I work uh, in uh, Vefresh, which is the largest innovation district in Riga. And continuing on the shoulders of uh, what Yanis and um, Alia just mentioned, I'm going to speak about uh, how to facilitate uh, cooperation in uh, living labs and how to facilitate development in what area we call uh, smart cities. I will do that uh, through story and narrative and perspective of uh, the work we do in a small, uh, well, a fairly small territory in the city of Riga, uh, uh, which is called Vefresh, which stands on, on, on the idea of Vef, which is the name of the, the community, and Fresh, the idea that there, there needs to be a revitalization and renovation of the area, not just there, but elsewhere. And the main goal of our um, uh, community is to be a pilot site for innovations in community, in smart city, utilities, and mobility. Uh, Befresh is a territory and a community which is known in Riga, perhaps not just in Riga, but uh, elsewhere in Latvia as well, as a, as a site where engineering and production has been taking place for at least 100 years. So in many ways, the territory we are inhabiting and working uh, right now hasn't changed much in 100 years, except the cars are a bit faster and louder, and there are more people here. And the area that we work is no longer producing cars or engines, but uh, in the area of ICT, um, mobile telecoms, and, and 5G. Efforts is constituted by uh, about seven companies, uh, some of the largest in IT sector in Latvia, both as far as uh, turnover and uh, employment goes, and also um, uh, civic institutions such as VEF Cultural Palace, which is a cultural center um, um, by the municipality of Riga. We are about uh, 4,000 people uh, working. Obviously, in COVID, we're distancing, and a lot of people work remotely. Uh, we constitute about 40% of the all ICT experts. Uh, in Latvia, and we are a substantial contributor to the state budget. Obviously, most people in ICT sector actually pay tax, so this is a this is a golden uh, golden goose for the state and for the city. The four areas we work on, which is innovation, infrastructure, uh, inspiration, education. By inspiration, I mean it's a top of mind area where all things in, in, in innovation can take place. And education is a crucial aspect for us. We'd like that uh, more. Uh, um, Youngsters, teenagers would study ICT sector because we think that's a, a crucial 
uh, life skill uh, and um, general mindset in general, and we believe that it's going to be ne uh, crucial in next decade. So we work with local schools, with local teachers, uh, and we, we um, facilitate uh, ICT companies deploying their knowledge and insight into, into local schools. And we hope that that approach can be then taken up and elsewhere in Latvia. This is a general principle that we follow you know, all the time. Uh, so I'm going to speak about several areas of, of our work. One is innovation that we want to facilitate in the, in the city because uh, Latvia and Riga is a moderate uh, innovator. Uh, so it, at, the, at, the, at the bottom uh, decile uh, of innovation uh, cities in, in Europe. So we believe that's, uh, that's uh, quite uh, a challenge for the city to grow. Uh, so we, uh, we try to pilot things in, in, in our territory which then become sort of a, a, an avant-garde of innovation uh, and smart city. So this is a mobility point that we created just uh, about two months ago. We worked on a project for more, more than a year and a half and it was just uh, um, made live and, 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 uh, and became fully functional uh, this July. Uh, and it has several aspects to it. It's a, it's a bike rack, it's a bike fixing station, it's a mobility sharing point where you can pick up a, a scooter or an or a, um, electric um, moped. Uh, you can charge your phone, uh, but more importantly, uh, we also um, use machine learning capacity to um, count traffic, cyclists and pedestrians. Why? Because uh, up until now, there has been very uh, scarce statistic on how much, how many people use uh, bikes uh, per day, and the cyclists and pedestrians as well. So that was an important aspect. We we'd like to have that uh, the, the decisions in the municipality, similar to uh, Alia said, would actually uh, represent uh, real statistics and data on the ground. Third of all, um, mobility point is a is a testing station, which is uh, the, the focal point of my conversation today that uh, these innovation districts, uh, which are open rather than closed, which are smart in that way that they are learning and they are uh, transforming along the way to become more useful uh, and more intuitive and more productive uh, for the city. So uh, we have uh, IoT capacity installed in, um, in, um, in, um, in uh, electric electricity um, um, rod, uh, and I'll address that a bit later. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, communities uh, should make the most of the uh, data that's available uh, for both climate perspective um, um, and mobility as well. Uh, so we believe that uh, all the data that's been gathered by companies, private or public, should be open so the communities, citizens and, and uh, startups can facilitate the use of data and perhaps create better solutions for that. Um, we also just installed a smart uh, lightning uh, point uh, in, in our um, mobility point, so not just, it's not just a, a, a last mile solution for sharing mobility, but also uh, a complex of mobility point, uh, including lightning. So we believe that in the future, the mobility point shouldn't be just dumb, where you, you park your bike and take the next bike, but they're open and they're learning whatever people are using in mobility point and the next mobility points which should be uh, developed across the city learn from this one so if this one makes mistakes the other ones sorry the other ones no longer make mistakes so that's a that's the idea of pilot territory and we believe this is the new black we shouldn't be making mistakes across the city we should be making mistakes at one point and reproducing the best results elsewhere we facilitate community building uh, through uh, a website called uzlaboelv or improve.com would be an English equivalent of that. Uh, it's a site where uh, citizens uh, can um, um, contribute their ideas about their community, whether that, whether that be um, um, a traffic uh, jam or that be uh, dysfunctional infrastructure or that be a problem at the community level, and they can post it uh, online. Um, and then hopefully they can facilitate the conversation between community members or hopefully with the city council. Right now, this is obviously uh, not, a, not a formal or an official uh, website. This has not been either paid or funded or created by the city municipality, but we thought similar to what um, um, Alia said, how about we try to 
show the best example in practice, and then if city uh, sees that this is a viable option, how to communicate with the citizens, then they can uh, they can uh, pick it up and use it. We hope that this is going to be a tool not just for communication between the city and the inhabitants, but also between the inhabitants themselves in the confines of one community or between many communities where they can not just uh, share the uh, mis, uh, mishaps and misfalls of the city, but also share experiences, how to get themselves heard, how to improve their infrastructure, and how to uh, get ahead with uh, their challenges. Uh, currently, we don't have that many. We have about 60 uh, submissions there, perhaps growing. But uh, in future, we believe that uh, this should be improved, and uh, they should have a mobile version um, where you could have a personalized account where you can post things, uh, connect with other people, and comment uh, and engage. We also plan uh, to extend this digital environment to, into real environment, where we'd have, we, would, we are going to have a neighborhood uh, hackathon uh, on, on, on city issues in 27th of December, where people can submit their ideas, and other teams would pick up uh, um, them as challenges and perhaps solve them in small teams, working in uh, 48 hours, uh, and uh, then hopefully submit these ideas to the city. We also have uh, approached approach city to say, could city uh, submit their problems, their challenges, their issues for, for our hackathon, and the, the teams can join around the, the challenges posted by the city. And we're going to have mentors from ICT companies, Accenture, LMT, uh, Institute of Computer and, and um, Electronics. So the, the teams will be mentored by experienced uh, people, both in, in ICT marketing and project development. Uh, we, we would hope that uh, the ideas that have been developed in this platform could then be uploaded to uzlabo.lv, where they can be voted. And so if, if they get more votes, kind of open democracy, open data, uh, then, the, then people um, can uh, say, well, how about city uh, addresses some of these issues in certain geographies? And then eventually this could be a multiple-step uh, prototype how uh, a citizen or, or community can uh, suggest an idea to the city council, then can be upvoted, criticized, improved, and then uh, submitted to budgeting uh, uh, competition in the city so the city can actually see openly how the idea came from, uh, from just uh, an idea to fruition in, in very specific geography and specific solution. We hope that this architecture, digital architecture, could be helpful for the city and for communities alike. Um, we're trying to facilitate innovation ecosystem. We believe that uh, the, for the next uh, decade, uh, it will be impossible for, for a single department, for a single community, or for a single company, uh, the three Cs, uh, to create innovations. That is not going to be happening. We believe that no single company or department or community has all the resources at hand to actually deliver up on, on challenges and uh, innovations and solutions. So therefore, we believe it's an ecosystem where each one supports one uh, capacity. So we help startups. We've helped uh, to facilitate uh, their uh, solutions in our in our district. So this is a startup um, which is testing uh, smart city uh, parking sensors. So a parking sensor installed in in, in a parking area uh, sends uh, sends information uh, to uh, to parking management team saying how many parking spots are still available. Uh, so that just uh, you know reduces the time when you're spinning around the city and uh, waiting for 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 uh, free parking to show up. We also uh, do a starting startup day where we uh, connect uh, startups with uh, investors. So why are we doing that? Because we believe that again, we can't work in uh, verticals anymore. That's that's an old dated model. We believe that's a very expensive model. That's a very expensive mistake, and we see it over and over and over again in the last decades where departments, communities, and co companies work in verticals, and they don't talk to each other, similar to what Ali and Yana said before. And we believe this is an old school way of doing things, and it's a very expensive and slow and, and uh, flawed way of what we're doing things. So we, we helped uh, Wingo, which is an artificial, um, a machine artificial intelligence machine learning capacity, which sorts trash uh, for, uh, for a user, which um, hugely uh, improves the UX or uh, customer experience in, in sorting trash, and we hope that these solutions could be deployed across the city. We're also starting a new mobility in incubator uh, this February, which will be the first technology incubator in Riga, and which would, again, we hope that a city council would submit their ideas. In fact, city council is a proje uh, project uh, partner, uh, and then the community both uh, professional and, and uh, civic would participate uh, in, in, in addressing the challenges. 
Lastly, uh, and my, my last point, uh, is about facilitating living labs. We believe that uh, uh, most of the solutions which are happening in, in universities and their labs are actually not tested in real environment or tested in artificial environment, and we believe that they have to be tested in real environment. So snow, uh, damaging hooliganism uh, or climate change, uh, cl climate aspects uh, in influence all of, the, all of the work. So in other words, that's why Google and Waymo test their cars in cities rather than just labs because the city is a different environment. So uh, the, right now, uh, the process of, of getting your innovation from, from lab to city is very, very uh, painful. It basically doesn't work. So what we try to ask is how can we enable companies, public sector, uh, uh, and residents to test their innovations, test their solutions, test their challenges in, in real environment. Uh, and uh, we'd like that uh, the public space uh, would be the area where it actually happens. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm halfway there, and now th finally th someone tells me that I'm, uh, you guys, you can't hear me. That's quite sad. I hopefully someone heard me. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably continue. We don't have enough time to go over. So maybe you just tuned in. Maybe you can finally hear me now, which is great. Uh, this is probably the most important thing anyway. So we're saying, how can we enable innovation uh, in real environment of the city? Not just labs, universities, where it's art artificial environment, but in real environment where... You know, there are other people, there are other technologies, there are other users inside. How can we test and facilitate that in, in, in public space without the pain? Why pain? Uh, uh, because we know that uh, solutions uh, need resilience, especially in, in, in the areas where there are four seasons, real, real summer, real fall, real winter, and real spring, and technologies are, usually don't take that into account, or they, they're unknown unknowns. Uh, first, uh, second of all, if we speak about IoT and, and machine learning, they need training, like any kid or a dog or a person needs training. If they're not trained in real environment, they're stupid, they're silly, and they make mistakes, and those mistakes cost a lot of money, therefore need, we need trained in real environment. So I uh, talk about uh, self-driving cars, they won't be running on our cities unless we pilot them in real cities. There won't be public buses running on, on, on uh, autonomous uh, capacity unless they're trained to do so with hilly roads, with, uh, with areas, with potholes, and et cetera. We need to check user needs. So how do people actually use our technologies? We know millions of cases when technology is out there and it's actually not working. It's not intuitive, it's not comfortable, it's not easy to use. Um, uh, and then we have unexpected uses, like you know, uh, such as hooliganism, uh, vandalism, or basically seasons uh, come over and distort the technology. So this was an example. Uh, of uh, what it took us to install a computer a vision solution uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Riga. So 11 steps, about 12 months to actually coordinate this process. So you would start out with, uh, wh where do you identify electricity? So then you're trying to identify who owns the electricity. How do you get access to that? Then you try to get permission from the owner. And just to keep in mind, this is a reconstruction of past. So we actually did that, and then we went back and said, well, this is what it took us to actually get electricity in a lamppost. But if you're a startup or a small company, you don't even know how much time it's going to take you. It might take you a year, a half year, three months, or four months. So you're basically in the darkness. So on one hand, you're dealing with technology. You're dealing with you know, high-tech stuff. On the other hand, you're in complete dinosaur stone age. You don't know how much time it's going to take you. And if you don't have somebody working in communications, do you have nine months going through four, five, six, seven departments to install uh, your a AI uh, learning capacity on a lamppost? You haven't even started to test te technology. You're just trying to install it, and that takes 12 months. By the time you have installed it and tested it for perhaps six months, you're 18 months into the, into the field. You're probably, you know, you're done. You're dead. No one has given you so much time to test anything. Your financier or investor uh, who, you're, who is in, investing in you in a startup or accelerated fund is long gone. You don't have a year and a half to test this. And obviously, when we talk about the rise of startups or Latvia being a safe place for startups, it's nonsense. This is the, this is the groundwork. No startup has 18 months to even get the thing started or nine months or 12 months. So what do we have? We have a way too long process to install any innovation. So what you have, you have 
uh, too many roadblocks, too many challenges to even get started, not to mention to actually test the, test the solution, product, or, or service. So this is completely unacceptable. If we want to be a, a capital where innovation is driven by startups or large companies, this is completely unacceptable. This is way too slow. This is not competitive. We're wasting money. Um, so this is a, this is our example uh, with uh, of actually timing. Yeah, four, uh, one to four weeks uh, to identify ac access points. Uh, two, one to twelve weeks uh, and identify an owner, and uh, from from four to twelve weeks to get the permission. So three months to get permission. Do you think that's feasible? Do you think that's competitive? I mean, w no wonder China's ahead of it. It probably took uh, two or three three days to do it. And then uh, you get, uh, and once you get the contract, right, you get the contract that it might take you about uh, four or five months, then you get another four months to get uh, construction permission, right? And then when you actually uh, get, uh, get the, uh, permission to get the data. So talk about speed, talk about, uh, talk about uh, agility, talk about innovation. This is, this is basically the, the graveyard of innovation. So deploy from, from idea to deployment, it may take up, take up you, take up to, to 12 from 18 months. And again, I'm saying this is us. We're persistent. We knew some people who to talk to and who to call. And even with that, it took us forever. If you're a startup, you don't have money or time to put into that. You probably give up. So uh, what happens uh, about uh, you know, SMEs and startups? You start uh, get seed financing. Uh, then it's, it's about 22 months from idea to se Series A, right? You don't have those 22 months. Uh, smart city startups, uh, you get seed financing, then you don't even know how much time is going to take you uh, to deploy the idea. So how can you convince an investor? How can you in, in, uh, convince a product owner? How can you convince anyone that you can actually deliver on that? You can't. So you, you don't get the money, you don't get the time, you're bust. So the roadmap isn't defined. No, one's, no one wants to take up responsibility. This department doesn't speak to this department, and there's the state, and there's the municipality. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of, it's, it's painful. And it, uh, your innovation either flops or it's left for fat cats. And even fat cats don't have time for that. So the way forward is what we, what we say that uh, we should define the roadmap, you know, for lighting, for electricity, for construction permits, for testing, for open data, access to data, and deployment of data. We should change legislation to reflect that, uh, to, uh, to reflect that uh, and in, contemporary, uh, in contemporary experiments so that there are territories in the city which you can get the green, right, the green light or the red carpet to test innovations. You won't be able to do that in everywhere in the city. Forget that. That's not going to, ha that's not going to happen. That's why you need pilot territories. With a, with a specific territory, outskirts of the city, or perhaps better, it's in real environment, because the product will need to be working in real environment. And then lastly, you need to find the best communications mechanisms between the startups or companies and institutions. How do you communicate that roadmap uh, systematically and uh, facilitate innovations? So we'd like to have that we have a small country with a uh, small bureaucracy rather than small country with big bureaucracy. We think that this is, uh, this is something that uh, uh, should not be happening, and we should try to avoid this as, as soon as possible. So finally, uh, we'd, we'd like to uh, create awareness that this is an issue that uh, actually hinders our development and innovation, and uh, we try to make it more accessible for all our stakeholders. How can we co-create the roadmaps between institutions and, and, and uh, small, uh, small startups so that it's, it's intuitive for both sides, so we wouldn't be in a war, as, uh, as Alia said before, so we would think together rather than decide, uh, announce, and then defend our ideas. And that's not helpful anyone, right? The same principles that Ali just said, they're absolutely applicable uh, to the smart city and innovation components as well. Uh, and th that would help us to, uh, try to try to make it uh, the, small, the smart city innovations not just be a, an area for Microsoft or LMT, but also for smaller startups that deploy their, their innovations and ideas, and oftentimes better ideas than the big companies in real estate environments. That's what we do in Refresh. Thank you. Any questions in YouTube? Stay safe and healthy. Well, uh, thank you, investors, for the beautiful presentation. Now we continue with the next presenter, Nestle Hazal Akbulut from Estonia, with um, the topic of speculating on the future of retirement of retirement in 2050. Please video. Esli, and I'm joining you virtually from Tallinn, Estonia. Today I will be talking about the role of speculative design 
in the context of design education. And I will bring up an example, uh, a recent project that has been held between the Foresight Center of Estonia and the Estonian Academy of Arts. So Estonian Academy of Arts uh, is the only public university in Estonia providing higher education in art, design, architecture, media, art history and conservation restoration. And it is based in the capital of Estonia, Tallinn. And the Foresight Center of Estonia uh, is a think tank of the Parliament of Estonia. And it aims at um, policy making that is informed by long term social and economic development opportunities and risks. So, for the speculative design course of 2020, we have collaborated with the Foresight Center of Estonia at the beginning of this year. And Estonian Academy of Arts uh, Interaction Design Master students, first year students more specifically, and product design third year students teamed up and they were tasked to rethink the future of retirement in 2015. This design challenge, the brief, came through the collaboration partner from the Foresight Center and they were asked to use a recent research conducted by the center on the future of retirement. And students were asked to work in teams, so they were divided into three teams and three, three groups and they found their own direction within the future of retirement and created narrations that envisioned their directions. Their narratives were supported with artifacts, speculative objects, to build provocation and discussion on the speculative futures. So a little bit uh, more about the partner. The Foresight Center is a think tank at the Estonian Parliament and its tasks include analyzing long-term developments in the society, identifying new trends and development avenues and drafting development scenarios. The Foresight Center bases its studies on a variety of possible developments and outlines alternative scenarios. As I mentioned before, uh, the Foresight Center of Estonia aims at policy making that is informed by long-term social and economic development opportunities and risks. And they do that by conducting studies and analyzes, generating scenarios, publishing newsletter, reporting on the latest analysis from, uh, from them and from think tanks around the world and publishing brief overviews of the selected trends and organizing conferences, seminars and thematic meetings. So we collaborated with the First Set Center and uh, the project was a three weeks long course. Uh, it wasn't a very long project, I would say. Uh, it was quite packed, but um, the students, all, all the teams were managed to deliver their desired outcomes and the uh, collaboration partner was really happy at the end. So this is the general outline of the course. Uh, we held the kickoff of the course in the, in the end of January and we visited the Parliament of Estonia together with students. And for the, for the first week of the course, the teams were asked to conduct desktop and user research through different methodologies to understand the current world that we're living in and to understand what was happening in 1990 and what could happen in 2050. So based on the insights that they choose, their directions that they wanted to pursue. So they conducted the in insights not only to understand the current world we're living in, but also to find the direction because future of retirement is a really big topic and they needed to narrow it down in order to speculate with, uh, on it. After they conducted their uh, non-structured interviews and their desktop research, they started uh, creating a scenario, a design fiction scenario that would envision their speculated future. So they were asked to create a design fiction scenario through a possible 2050 and speculate about the possible uh, problems of our futures. When their scenarios were ready, they were asked to create a speculative object, an artifact, that would make uh, their future more tangible. And they were asked to find a touch point through their the scenarios and to make that touch point more tangible and to bring it to life. And uh, after three weeks, they presented their design fiction scenarios and their speculative objects to design uh, for site center. And uh, their presentations were followed with a discussion 
and uh, other design mentors or designers uh, from Estonian Academy of Arts were invited to the discussion and the presentations. So this is the team, uh, the students that worked uh, during the project. Uh, it was a diverse team, meaning that there was not only uh, Estonian students, for example, but there were also students from uh, other countries such as Italy or Russia. And they were not only, uh, for example, interaction designers, but also product designers. And the students were uh, mentored by me uh, as an interaction designer uh, lecturer uh, from Estonian Academy of Arts, and also Johanna Vallistu from the Foresight Center. Johanna uh, helped our students to stay on track and to analyze the research more insightfully and to gather authentic data throughout the process. Now I would like to briefly talk about the deliverables of the collaboration. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were three teams, so three uh, possible futures and uh, possible uh, scenarios and uh, speculative objects. So the first team uh, asked themselves, what if the elderly could become medical suppliers in a collapsed healthcare system? The team focused on economical and healthcare aspects of retirement and started their project with a trend analysis to understand the social, technological, ecological, economic and political trends that might be related to their focus. They have realized that because of the aging population in 2050, the healthcare system might collapse by 2050 causing a lowering in pensions. They have embodied the elderly in 2050 with a fictional character called Mariu. She is a former cleaning lady who lost her job because in 2050, cleaning is no longer a human's profession, but a robot. She's feeling useless and wouldn't like to cut out of the society. Although she is good with technology, she is unable to keep up with the rapidly emerging technologies. And uh, she was one of the first in her company to have a chip in her hand to open the company car, but still uh, she is not able to keep up with uh, rapidly emerging technology. The design fiction that they have narrated is around elderly values in a society of an aging Estonia. Although enabling the elderly into medical suppliers sounds like a dystopia, it is still part of our possible futures. Together with the negative consequences, this scenario has also benefits for the elderly, such as giving the elderly a new role in society, feeling less lonely and having an opportunity to contribute to the family economy. Hi, this is Andrea, answering from Marseille, person number 368809. How can I help you today? Uh, hello? Hi, I'm calling from Tallinn. I have a problem starting with the profile. Sure, have you uploaded your virtual identity as a profile? Am I speaking now with Marie Kivi, code 06621? Yes, yes, I already did okay, it. Okay, let me see. I see you already received a visit and a problem from the doctor. Is it correct? Yes, he came on uh, Monday. Such a nice guy. And he put the thing in my wrist and... Uh, oh, yeah, the implant. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, any problem with that? Any pain from the date on your profile? Seems everything's working well? Yes, yes, it's all fine. Very well, then. How can I help you? Well, I haven't received any email. I mean, the email with the code. I didn't receive it. Okay, okay, no problem. I can give you the access right now. Oh, you are very kind. Okay, here is your profile. Do you want me to show you the basic function while I'm here? Uh, yes, thank you. Why not? Okay, so here on top, you will see when someone will try to book an appointment or send a message to you. Then if you scroll down, here you can see the main possible transaction, the basic ones. Uh, is there a specific one you might be interested in? Oh, I just want to understand what they mean. Oh, uh, well, for example, dialysis can be quite rewarding, but it takes a long time. Oh, it, it's okay. I don't have much to do anyway. I have too much free time. Actually, I'm happy if I can be helpful. Okay, so clicking here. Yes, you can have more details, information about it. Okay, now please close the window. 
And here you can become available for the transaction. If you click here, people who need it can write you to fix an appointment. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. I will read it by myself. Thank you very much. No problem. Have a nice day. Hello, this is Anna answering from Poland. Person number 367233. How can I help you today? Uh, hello. I'm having some problems with the website. Sure. Am I speaking with Mario Givi? Personal code 06621? Yes, it's me. Okay, what seems to be the problem? Well, I can't do more donations with my profile. I don't understand. I push the button to become available, but nothing changes. Let me see. Hmm. It's simple. You have to wait before proceeding with new transaction. For medical reasons, we can't allow you to be available for new transactions immediately. When your body has been recovered, the implant will update your profile. Do you know how much will I wait? I really need some money. Now, see, my son just lost his job last week. I'm not even doing it for me. I just want to help him. Well, I can't do anything. The system will give you the permission automatically when you will be ready. But have you considered other kinds of donations? What do you mean? Well, if you scroll down and open this page, uh, I can show you. There are other highly paid options, but they cause permanent changes and need more invasive operations. Oh. The design fiction starts discussions around elderly values in Asian Estonia while bring, being provocative. So the goal of this team was to be as as provocative as possible and they created their design fiction scenario in the form of a video and they created an artifact that was a web-based product that would help elderly to sell their organ functions. And second team asked themselves what if the way we eat will become the main reason for stratification in society? What if in 2050 our food will be the indicators of our health and wealth causing a polarization in society. The team started by focusing on the basic needs of the elderly in 2050. They talked to people to gather insights on what could be the elderly's basic needs in 2050. After their investigation, they have found out that one of the our possible futures is the one where there is no such thing as retirement and where the basic needs are covered by the government through a service support system. They have speculated the future where we live in, in a society where polarization is really high between the poor and rich. Technology for food making has developed rapidly and rich mostly eat artificial food. The soil has little quality for growing food, which is why the poor mostly grow potatoes for survival. With the rapidly emerging technologies, there are many new professions for the elderly to integrate into society as artificial intelligence trainers or smart farmers, for example. Politics are focused on citizens' well-being more than the economy. Governments are supporting the elderly in their new professions instead of paying pensions. The what-if question guided the team to speculate in 2050. They have placed their what-if question in the center of a futures wheel diagram, a methodology for identifying the new potential consequences of an event. First, they have thought of the direct consequences of their scenario and then moved on to the indirect quest, uh, consequences. In the end, they have obtained a web-like map of the implications of a future scenario. With the help of their findings, the team narrated a design fiction scenario in the form of a diary. Diary of a smart farmer who wants to create superfood for the poor to decrease the stratification in society. His business is supported by the government and he does not get any pensions but gets support from the government to deliver his creations to the poor. Together with their narrative, the team 
team also designed a potato-like object with had pomelo fruit inside. It was that super farmer's uh, failed production. The artifact was cut open during the presentations to bring the audience to the speculated 2050. The artifact being multisensory helped the audience to build emotional connections and start discussions around the narrative. And the last team asked themselves, what if VR would become the main medium of communication in 2050? Virtual reality will most likely play a very important role in the future of communication and our way of interacting with our world. What if by 2050, VR becomes the main medium of communication? What if by 2050, VR becomes the main medium of communication? The team talked with uh, virtual reality experts together with the future of elderlies of 2050 and the current elderlies of 2020. After their investigation, they have realized in a future where VR will become very accessible and affordable and a position to technology will arise. Technology escape points such as physical spaces will be built to enable humans to escape technology. After their exploration, the team speculated a future where the main communication medium becomes VR and people start spending so much time in VR that they will need reminders of the real world. A vest that goes together with VR glasses, which is made of e-textiles, meaning smart textiles, to remind us which reality that we are uh, situated in, virtual reality or the real world. So the West will change its texture and its shape to indicate us where we located at. Together with the West, they have created a design fiction narrative of their fictional character and provoked the audience through their narration. Their design fiction narrative showcased the possible problems of a future where we are spread to our daily lives as a communication device. Humans will need spaces to escape technology and will need reminders of the real world to recall the virtuality that we're situated in. So when new technologies emerge, their ethical, cultural, social and political impacts are often unknown. However, speculative design can help us look into the possible impacts by debating potential consequences through discussion and provocation. I hope that the uh, speculative futures of 2050 have inspired you and gave you a glimpse of what could be the potential consequences of our potential design choices. Unfortunately, today I don't have uh, enough time to show you all the speculative objects or the design fiction scenarios, but I'm adding a link here to my presentation where you can find more about um, speculative objects and design fiction scenarios online. And if you have more questions about the design process or the design outcomes, please feel free to reach me out. I would be more than happy to provide you with more information. Thank you very much.
continue our comments and our second section, technologies in a new economic and service models, um, is uh, uh, started with a uh, presentation by Gunita Kulikovska from Latvia, Extended Participation, the Culture of Digital Master Planning. Okay, hello, hi, how are you? Uh, I hope you guys over there, I'm just looking where the camera is, uh, hopefully somewhere, okay, I see you here. Uh, you guys behind the screen, uh, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Um, my role in here is, uh, is not to tell you how to uh, use the, the new technology, new medium in order to uh, become bolder and stronger. My role here is to bug a little bit, to penetrate a little bit your thinking uh, about urban planning beyond what we know, beyond what we have ac been expecting uh, from participation. Uh, so this is also what the title says, Extended Participation, the Culture of Digital Master, master Planning, meaning that uh, no technology ever can really substitute um, the behaviors, uh, really the nature of how we participate and uh, how we plan our cities. However, we can embed new titles in, uh, in digital master planning um, culture. Very well. Yeah, just checking on things. So, um, as I thought, you're going to be seeing just my presentation. Here's a little bit <laughs> of my face, um, here or, or over there in your in your screen. Um, my main main focus on, and as already um, was said. I'm a founder and CEO of company uh, Vividly, and uh, we usually say that we turn the space into experience. The mediums that we work are experiential, spatial, uh, immersive. Uh, 3D, 360, virtual reality, extended reality are the tools that we daily exploit in order to reach the goal, to deliver the message in the best way possible, emotionally, experientially. And uh, this goes a little bit back into, uh, into my background. So I'm trained as an architect and practiced as an urban strategist. And when we talk about image of the place, um, also in placemaking and urban planning, we usually uh, sort of select all these like three layers, the mental space, the social space, and of course, also the physical space. To me, it also gives a direct translation what XR or extended reality actually means. To me, it's not another piece of technology, another, not another uh, headset or, um, or just a title or abbreviation. To me, those are the, these three layers embedded into communication. And today, in particular, uh, we're going to be looking at um, XR, uh, this extended mediums for citizen engagement. And uh, those cases that I'm going to be describing, mentioning you a little bit, will come from Augmented Urban's project, uh, which I have been working for already over two years. So if you want to know more about the project, please follow augmentedurbans.eu. The project is actually just about to end and we are summarizing the results, so we'll be really happy to share uh, the knowledge. So all these cities were somehow involved in, in the project and had their also pilot cases and pilot, uh, pilot projects where they actually tried to find a way and how an XR or ex extended reality approach method technology can be used in urban planning. And um, we usually select two types of participation, um, especially nowadays when you guys know that uh, uh, the physical meetings are quite limited due to the precaution uh, of uh, activities and events. So we say these are the offline activities that we uh, organize face to face. The familiar ones for you might be workshops, meetings, presentations, pitches and uh, also online. So uh, in digital master planning and digital planning, there have been uh, discussion around uh, different softwares and programs and platforms that could allow us to bring planning online, to bring planning uh, digital and discuss with people digitally. So um, I am gonna just select a few, basically three different use cases that we have 
been uh, working on during the Augmented Urbans project. So the first one uh, is, as it says, virtual teleports. And what comes into your mind when I say virtual teleports? That's teleporting yourself somewhere uh, where you can't be present at the moment. Like, okay, the very trivial like, example would be me just teleporting myself into the, I don't know, uh, Mars, for example, or, or Moon, or even Thailand, you know? Depends on your vision um, and interest at the moment. But how about teleporting into the site, what you are planning? You can imagine that, um, Outline, creating an outline plan, uh, creating a zoning. It's a kind of large scale planning tasks. And it's usually quite you know, complicated to bring people's voice into this uh, kind of a huge scale planning. But if we would be able to take all citizens and go into the excursion uh, to the site where what we are planning, this would give us a very straightforward feedback what could be improvements. But Obviously, uh, we cannot uh, do that in uh, such a scale. So uh, what we can do is just bring these particular planning questions into these virtual teleports. And while we are still like here at the workshop, uh, we can be teleported and have a kind of emotional presence of what we are actually planning. You may be kind of knowing the cases where uh, where planners are, you kind of pointing on blueprints and using a post-its on, on trying to get the feedback, how would citizens would like this to be improved? And uh, well, in for like 80% of the answers, they already know. And there are just these 20% that they are seeking for, but they are affording quite a lot of, uh, they're investing quite a lot of effort in order to get that. Uh, in Cezy's case, uh, pretty simple, lots of activities and events that were held live, uh, but it's very hard to get the understanding what this Tirolishi area means to the, to the citizens. And uh, yeah, for example here, a very simple 360 videos and photos were brought into the uh, simple Samsung Gear VR uh, in order to get people to understand what are the planners thinking of. Uh, this was the first iteration. In the second iteration, there was already some feedback implemented from the workshops uh, in these 360s. So once you say, hmm, laser activities, right? What does it mean to the, to the person? You, don't, you can't really e imagine. But once you draw it in this 360, just a simple sketch, it makes you uh, understand a lot better and what are the spatial sort of circumstances of this idea. And in here as well, uh, we can see uh, we can see also uh, an online tool which goes in very parallel of uh, all the offline activities. Um, so here we used uh, 3D data, or uh, to be particular, lidar data uh, from from the last scan in order to uh, show what are the terrain uh, particularities of this area, because. Uh, we were planning, uh, we were very focused on what are the nature correlation with this uh, sort of a built environment structures. Um, the second we could say is experience simulation. Uh, so when, when we say experience simulation, again, um, it's very hard for me to get in, the, in your shoes, for example, or in your shoes. Uh, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing? Uh, and the same happens with planners, of course, and also with architects in particular, right? So to be able to understand better the experience of others, mm, uh, virtual reality is, uh, is a great platform to help us. And in particular, when we can bring an interaction within this, uh, within this space and within this point of view. So we, here we can see a Helsinki case. They also uh, create a pop-up uh, activity, pop-up office in Telosikatu uh, Street. So their planning, uh, planning case was to redesign the street area, basically, and, uh, and also the, the areas that are connected to the street. And everyone, um, well, just passing by could have this chance to mark up their important stations, important, uh, important points and crossings and aspects of this virtual experience, which we could not be like kind of 
in reality, we could not just go into the, this very long street and, and just put the post-its, right? We could lose a lot of information on the go. But with this kind of platform, uh, we are able to collect the information, collect the data, and also follow up on that. As we can see here, uh, it goes hand in hand with very analog approach, right? You can see there on the table also the 3D model um, uh, sort of uh, printed out and put on the, on, the, on the table. In order to have this really re relation, what are the spatial, like a, like a form volume, a relationship with the experience, right? It's kind of being in, in, uh, in the two scales. You are a first person view and also a bird's eye. So obviously it gives a lot better perspective to people how to engage in the planning and also to the planners. Later on, um, what is very important for, uh, for the urban planning is also different um, sort of seasons and uh, different circumstance, circumstances of weather. Um, of course, like the snow, um, a rain, whatever. What, what are the circumstances? Create a different perspective towards urban space. Uh, and also, in this case, it was very important to kind of um, analyze the different situations of uh, greenery. So, as the project was talking a lot about the resilience and, and ecosystem services, uh, in Helsinki case, in this particular square, um, they were creating different simulations and scenarios. So, how this square should be. Uh, landscaped, I'd say, and what kind of benefits uh, from, uh, from for for uh, for ecosystem it could provide. And again, we can look at the tables, sheets, uh, diagrams, uh, whatever different way and how to look at the data. But once we experience that, it's an, it entirely creates you know a different image, more emotional, more relatable um, to to what we see and what could possibly become this scenario. Um, as addition, again, a different media. We have VR, we have online, we have touchscreen, for example. What about us looking at different layers of the, of the planning uh, uh, perspective? What are, what are the historical layers that have influenced the existing plan and what would be the future plans? Um, trying to combine in this one station, as you see, uh, different scales, different perspectives so that uh, anyone without any professional knowledge could be able to onboard and understand this planning vision and engage. In Helsinki case, it is very important to mention that uh, they have mapped out whole city and uh, there is this 3D model accessible um, for anyone to use. So it's open source 3D model and there are infinite options to how, uh, how the model can be exploited, can be used. And in fact, this, what I presented you uh, just, is one of the samples and how it can help the urban planning and citizens to get on board with uh, planning decisions. And also the Stockholm case, yeah, so it starts itself. This is just um, a screen capture, we could say, uh, from virtual experience. Once you open the video on YouTube, you are able to actually uh, just pan it 360. Um, so if you follow the project, you'll be able to uh, get to this link as well. So again, uh, you interact yourself within 360 and, and you are able to understand better the story. There is quite a bit of um, uh, storytelling when it comes to the, to the virtual reality, to immersive media. And we already know, and hopefully you have been <laughs> discussing that, uh, and previous speakers can be mentioning the user experience, the user interaction design, the service design. All these aspects of design are very vital and very essential to be implemented in a virtual reality experience. In Stockholm case, they were simulating, for example, what what it look if, if the pollution would raise dramatically if we continue to uh, our habits as they are, or what could be a flood situation in this uh, particular area. So to provide people a little bit more emotional, more closer understanding of how ecosystem actually reflects to our daily life. And if we continue like that, what would be the scenarios? Once you just hear it, oh, it's plus two degrees, plus three degrees by 2050, you're like, yeah, well, yeah, more or less. But once you really feel it, it's, it's a lot better. And here, um, 
but you can also uh, see how people can interact and see uh, and do kind of a, uh, decisions to make their choices in order how how would they for example uh, if they would plant a tree where they would plant a tree and uh, there are some consequences uh, coming out from their actions, let's say, which again the experience provides. And the third, uh, but not the, not the least important, I'd, I'd, see, I'd say that uh, campaigning and awareness raising, which again, planners are stepping into the field of communication a lot and the field of, uh, of marketing in a way, uh, uh, of the planning processes of the cities and campaigning uh, is definitely becoming a part of uh, everyday planner sort of toolkit. Um, in Tallinn, what comes into your mind when I say uh, insects, when I say pollinators? Um, Tallinn was kind of coping with, uh, with the perception that people had when it comes like uh, the, the kind of a natural meadows and natural habitat, like you can, you can imagine uh, not really a nice, just lone, very well cut grass, but really a wild flowers and wild grass um, as, um, as a pollinator sort of habitat. So they were working on the project to create this pollinator corridor. So for bees, for butterflies, for all the pollinators that actually provide our our food uh, to to be there in also part of the city and they used the AR application uh, uh, Avalin for for actually a lot of cases uh, and in different stage but the most important is that they wanted to educate people on how these pollinators could be actually friendly and useful um, so you can imagine a huge butterfly um, just stepping on your like hand, you know, and really seeing that in a real life gives you just uh, a lot better perspective uh, that th this could be also friendly and useful. Uh, AR, in fact, is uh, definitely used more as as for campaigning, uh, less of um, just a practical tool I'd say however there have been uh, there have been really a drafts of sketches ideas where we could use AR applications to um, kind of a see overlapping data uh, the data that is underground this goes very well together with um, a city digital twin so uh, when we would have all the data digital we could actually be able to see uh, how this overlay of a data uh, works in our daily life and as well as for like engineering and very professional use of course wow a lot of hashtags isn't it uh, a, a lot of keywords that uh, may kind of hook to your interest but you can't really understand how it sits together well um, it's just a process and and it's ongoing process but at the end of the day uh, the aim of all these activities campaigns technologies whatever the world we would a word we could uh, choose is to lift the planning culture into another level so to connect uh, with the people in a better way, a more efficient way, uh, so that we all work together as planners and as designers, as inhabitants, as city, uh, as municipality, as such. And uh, uh, it's not about technology as much as it is about the process, because when we would uh, look only on technology, if I would promote only a headset here or virtual reality for all the solutions, it will be just a short term application of it. But once we think about the process, once we think about how we redesign the planning culture, uh, it's where we aim for a long term uh, gain. And um, of course, the technology is not uh, like the one develops alone and uh, this is why very important to put the questions in the right order which is where we usually start um, start with the why and uh, what is the story what is the call to action what planners want to achieve because I have seen so many technologies bold things innovative processes applied just for the sake of their being innovative uh, and not really understanding what we want to succeed with that, what is actually what we are testing. 
And uh, how is very important from user perspective. So they are like citizens and we address them in, in the scale, like everyone who lives in the city. And there are also groups of people that use the space or we need the very particular feedback, like school children or parents of school children or teachers or Airbnb hosts, right? And they receive information and they understand, their understanding about planning is entirely kind of a different and what they expect and how they uh, receive the content is different. Uh, when we say society, when we say citizens, it's probably solutions that we want to bring online so that they can access the solution in any time available for them but when we say uh, teachers or Airbnb hosts we think about uh, gathering them as a group and asking the questions or giving them, them particular experience so and from these two first questions uh, the third one kind of arises so technology is the last kind of a solution that you give for answers of these uh, two questions and it's very important to keep it this way, not another way around. And as I said, technologies do not develop alone, so it's not one VR or, I don't know, chatbots I was going to mention you, but uh, it's about them working together. Um, like we did in Cesi's case, for example, implementing the chatbot and testing out whether the chatbot can help to kind of pro provoke and discuss with people um, uh, remotely, right? So without the presence of a real planner, you have a kind of a chatbot that, that kind of works in the same way, gives you a bit of information, asks you a question, gives you a bit of information, asks you a question. Um, and that allows us to work in a much efficient, more data-based uh, kind of a manner because uh, what we get out from that is CSV file that we can analyze in different angles, right? Uh, where we can look uh, how many, how often these answers were kind of together and so on. Also, 5G networks um, allows us to open the broadband, broadband for uh, online um, solutions in particular. Uh, so, the case of the VR, for example, uh, if you qu create quite complicated, very immersive experience, you need the location base. So, you need to go to some place where you can, you can see that, because most probably you don't have a headset at home. Then 5G, in fact, would uh, kind of provide um, this connection enough, good enough, that you can open this VR experience from your phone, for example. And city sensing, which regards to IoT, uh, so Internet of Things, so meaning that data comes from different places around, and uh, like this 3D space, virtual space, is, is, is just a visualization of where that data comes from in real time. So you can see that city develops and, uh, um, and progresses, you know, and technologies are uh, implemented and integrated and they all benefit each other. It's like an average level of progress is raising, not just one technology. And uh, last but not least, I'd say, I would kind of leave you with these questions. Uh, that if we live in this on-demand uh, world where we are so used to have uh, the feedback real-time, data real-time, answer real-time, if I well, ask you a question about what's going to happen in this area, I'm expecting from the city to answer it right away, right? As it is with uh, our consumer uh, behavior, right? Open data, where all the world and also here in Latvia uh, we are going towards being more open, uh, open data uh, nation. So, uh, being able to kind of open the data for for use for application uh, further and real time. So again, when we expect things to happen now and to be realized now, in this situation, how do we lift the planning culture? How do we rethink the the metrics, the key points that have been existing in, in planning culture for so long time. How do we address more of a process, less of a technology? These are the questions that I said um, 
Um, I'm still looking for an answer, and if you are uh, curious to explore or you or would like to experiment with this, uh, please feel free to um, yeah um, to, to to just write me or or address these questions uh, further because there are quite new fields to explore and as I said we're still developing still experimenting a lot with these so uh, urban planning technology it's all open field and um, just uh, inviting you to join thank you very much. Any Thank questions you. or, you, or yeah, for this? <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, let us, uh, let us continue. Um, thank you, thank you, Konita, for the beautiful uh, presentation. Well, actually, we can't help um, thinking about beautiful uh, places and spaces in the world and uh, about, uh, well, this time when we are limited um, and confined in our rooms, homes and cells, glued to computers, but actually wishing to go to Tallinn to talk to a butterfly from a meadow in the city yeah. center, uh, that's so beautiful. Or even yeah. to Tsessis, to, or to Tsirulish, you to can Tsirulish. just teleport. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. if you open this Augmented Urban's uh, uh, website, you're going to be guided to YouTube, where you can actually teleport yourself in, oh. Uh, in oh. 360 videos yeah. and see those, those yeah. scenes that we used for, mm -hmm. uh, for our work. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm just reminding that um, we can, again, encourage some more questions in uh, live chat, in the YouTube chat. Um, if uh, if they, there are any questions, please um, share um, some ideas, maybe also. Um, we continue uh, with... Um, uh, with um, the uh, conference, and uh, now we are going to have... Sorry. Um, um, uh, with uh, with uh, some videos, um, and um, and uh, well, I'm visible now on the screen, <laughs> but I would like to announce a video that uh, uh, follows from Paul Van Herk fr uh, from Australia and Natalia Savelyeva from Russia with a title that is extremely interesting. To so let us watch. Hello everyone, my name is Lyudmila Savilyeva. I'm an artist and researcher based between Moscow, Bremen and Berlin. And today I'm going to start the presentation of our project, which is called Tudasida. So please enjoy. First of all, I would like to explain who we are and how we met. And then I will talk more about our field research and what we did in Russia. We are a group of four, Paul Van Herk from the right side, is an architect and writer from Australia. He will explain the ideas around agriculture and applied AI. Next to Paul is Ivan Kuzerov. He is an AR and VR developer from Russia. Thomas Grogan is an artist and design researcher from France. We began collaborating during our time at the New Normal a Speculative Urbanism think tank at Strelka Institute for Media Architecture and Design in Moscow in 2018, united by our common interests in the graphics, bodies, and the residues of network global systems. Our first research project together delves into the field of applied AI, agriculture, and food design. Being the researchers at the program, we had the chance to have a few field trips inside and outside Russia. We visited Magadan, a remote port, and site former Soviet labor camps during the Stalin era, and two special economic zones, Hong Kong on the picture, and Shenzhen. In China, we investigated large-scale production and distribution systems around which global supply chains converge as well as the design potential of both cities shifting special status in relation to the mainland. On the picture, we can see a giant drone produced for agriculture by a local company, Eagle Brother. Being in China, we began this project by asking, 
how the ritual acts of eating and shaping landscapes can be put in more explicit interplay to benefit of both. During our research, we took a few interviews which had a huge impact on our project. The first one was with Andrei Razin, Minister of Agriculture of Moscow region. Andrei told us about current government incentives to develop vast abandoned growing sites that are surprisingly close to Russia's largest city, Moscow. He also explained that just like in other landed states, low capital investment monocultures like wet, meat and dairy are still standard practice in Russia. Sanctions in 2014 cut off much of the foreign supply of fresh fruit and vegetables, which hold a special luxuriant status in the frigid nation. At the end, he invited us for the opening of the biggest greenhouse in Moscow region. The second interview was with Alexei Ivanov, supermarket supplier. We talked about impact of sanctions on farm business, told us about the eco farms before 2014 and after, and also explained the communication between farms and supermarkets. Through these interviews, we decided to visit an eco farm, Veretivo, and the biggest in Moscow region, Ivanistovo greenhouse. The following year, a 21 hectare greenhouse complex Ivanisivo was built on the outskirts of Moscow at a cost of 500,000 million US dollars. It grows only one crop, cucumbers. They grow quickly and predictably, which is artificial lighting and climate control, monitored intensively around the clock and throughout all seasons. Agriculture interiors such as this are becoming standard fixtures of European landscapes. And even if it is largely made up of Dutch built and designed equipment. On this picture, we can see Veretivo, an agritourism operation near Moscow that builds pleasant and productive land forms together. Thank you. And now a word from Paul. Hi, everyone. And thanks for having us. My name is Paul Van Herk, and I'm one of the four researchers behind this project. I'm going to give an outline of the driving propositions that we formed from the field research that Ludmilla just spoke to. Food has always terraformed and landscapes have always created recipes. As instruments of this feedback, humans have been making active correlations between ingredients and terrain for millennia. We shape landscapes to live in, and shadow landscapes to feed from. These landscapes overlap in what we still call the countryside. We began this project by asking how the ritual acts of eating and shaping landscapes can be put into a more explicit interplay to the benefit of both. Firstly, we vis visited an agritourism operation in Moscow that built pleasant and productive landforms together. We discovered that it was unprofitable and, and quite inefficient um, very difficult to picture at platform scale. Platforms already do food. IBM Chef Watson was an AI that produced quirky recipes based on patterns of ingredients that tend to appear together in a giant data set of dishes. Parent companies like Deliveroo link establishments to individuals. Companies like Blue Apron penetrate further into the private domain, delivering ingredients and recipes to dormant kitchens. In their marketing, they pitch a more direct connection between food manufacturers and urban eaters, but at the same time, they retain an integrity of recognizable ingredients and the aesthetics of pure provenance. We were fascinated by this bucolic and Puritan representation of the source and the site of ingredients, best exemplified by the Blue Apron slogan, food is better when you start from scratch. We were in Russia and the history of Russian agriculture taught us that there's no starting from scratch. Our research took us through the Stolopin reforms that privatized feudal land holdings and led to the 1905 and 1917 revolutions. Uh, we looked at the Soviet five-year plans that forced predetermined reaping patterns on the Russian landscape and led to mass starvation in Ukraine and Kazakhstan. In a meeting with the Minister for Agriculture of Moscow region, we learned about current government incentives to develop vast abandoned growing sites that are surprisingly close to Moscow and still very cheap. 
low capital investment monocultures are still standard practice in Russia, much like they are in other large landed states. So wheat, meat, dairy. The sanctions of 2014, however, put pressure on the foreign supply of fresh fruit and vegetables. And these things hold a special luxuriant status in Russia for obvious reasons. The following year, after the sanctions, that is, a 31 year greenhouse complex was built on the outskirts of Moscow at a cost of 500 million US dollars. It grows one thing, cucumbers. And cucumbers grow within quickly and predictably. They monitored intensively around the clock and throughout all seasons. They're not alone in Europe. Agricultural interiors such as this are becoming standard fixtures of European landscapes. In fact, the greenhouse itself is of Dutch origin, although Russia um, is not able to import Dutch fresh produce. For us, we saw that there was a that there is a lingering conflation of nature and agriculture, and it's really been a disaster for both. Uh, the separation of the two must be furthered for the sake of other remaining ecosystems being ravaged by uh, increasing agriculture. The energy intensiveness of bringing crops indoors may even be justifiable at a large scale if they're located uh, very close to sites of consumption and the intensity of their outputs is turned right up. The trophic cascades of forests and backyard growing movements like permaculture that mimic forests work too slowly and too small a scale currently to be of much help to us. If new ecosystems can be synthesized indoors, they do not have to follow the same steps, rules and pace of the forest or of the food forest. If new ecosystems are synthesized, then so, th then so should their products be. Basically our attachment to the consistent identities of what we eat, the very food products themselves, is so strong that we uh, that we might wipe out entire bio biomes and we have wiped out entire biomes for it. So in this project, we're proposing um, that bounded landscapes that are sensed and expressed by an artificial intelligence that is able to manage their intensity and complexity. Artificial intelligence is already widely used in agriculture, mostly for tracking and monitoring at a, a fairly database level Machine vision is sometimes used to identify defects and diseases in plants. You can determine when a goat is ready to mate and the way it walks when it goes to be milked. Soil sensors measure chemistry, water content and acidity. Robot, uh, robotics are used to weed and plant and pick produce. You have IoT devices, um, address boxes and crates. Location track is a tinier than ever. With all of this combined, uh, it's a very small step to imagine the management of entire sites by AI systems that can process all of this information. It could index the growth, interaction, and formation of multiple hybrid species at once, rather than just monocrops. This slightly echoes the permaculture principles of companion plants in the food forest, as I mentioned earlier, but it's much faster and, and has also much stranger outputs. The outputs, in a way, have to be strange. An AI that senses a landscape must also express that landscape's propensity for experimentation. It may be the human taste for predictability and equilibrium that destroys ecologies. The name of this project is Tuda Suda, which means back and forth in Russian. It has slightly dirty, hustling connotations, and it's a little bit funny. It represents the central idea of two AIs that negotiate food and landscape priorities between them. So one is interested in food and the other one is interested in landscape. In testing the conversations they might have in trying to reach agreement, we start to see an undeniably social interaction forming between them. Yet it's stripped of culture and relentlessly cooperative. There's no ego. If one proposes the addition of something new into their exchange, the other may reject thousands of iterations of it until its own priorities are satisfied too. As millions of these compromises and negotiations take place in both directions at once, the ability of uh, the pace and also the complexity of cooperation increases geometrically from what uh, human systems would allow. Unlike the human systems, however, the AIs do not see the whole picture of what they're doing. 
because in isolation or totality, they would approach vanishing points of artificial idiocy each. They would both aim to optimize to the point of absurdity. The dialogue of misunderstanding mimics the experimentation of an ecosystem, the optimization of interrelations rather than a fixed outcome. And then there are the humans. As necessary instruments in interplay of food and landscape, and probably the largest on this planet, humans must be immersed in the conversation too. Image and speech have become the common ground for testing machine learning outputs today, but AI has proven itself also a master creator of new textures and mistaken identities in the process. Machine generated textures can express the surface qualities of construction materials and edible substances together. That's where the farm and the plate meet quite literally and very graphically. They can be built and ingested on the same plane through an interface. Textures have long been an interchange between food and landscape aesthetics in painting, from still life, impressionism, in Shutterstock. As an interchange between senses, textures can be understood by touch and taste, as well as sight and sound. For our purposes, uh, texture became a rich and fuzzy interchange that could be juxtaposed against an accountability of, of uh, let's say, natural language processing. The video, the animation that we're about to show you follows the demonstration of an immersive virtual space that is both system diagram and interface. It can be navigated as a three dimensional time machine of sorts that displays the history of the dishes that have been produced for purchase at one end and then the accompanying landscapes that the purchase of the dish has produced at the other. In the middle between them, between dish and farm, are the textures of the negotiation that cause both, uh, both to be produced. The interface therefore becomes the decor for new dining rituals that take place in a graphic that displays the effects of the dining itself, its products and its origins, an augmented reality in a very meaningful sense. So now we'll show you the video, thank you very much. Tuda Suda is a platform that generates new forms of food and agricultural landscape simultaneously. At its center are two artificial intelligence systems that are in constant negotiation with each other. They are called Chef and Farmer. Chef is constantly experimenting with new ingredients and inventing a new dishes for human consumption. Chef registers and predicts the probable taste of human users as they move through the interface looking to order something fresh. Chef sees food as relative qualities of flavor, profiles, textures and colors. Chef is not attached to existing ingredients, traditions or provenance. The dishes that humans find in the interface usually are not available for long. As each recipe expires, a new one replaces it. The preparation of each dish begins weeks in advance in a dialogue between recipe and the landscape that generated its strange ingredients.
Moscow is surrounded by a belt of underutilized farmland that was abandoned at the end of the Soviet era. This land has a very short growing season and was typically used for milk and meat production. Large government incentives have led to the rapid expansion of semi-automated indoor agriculture at an immense scale. As the periphery of agricultural interiors begins to form around the city, these sites become laboratories for experimenting with the direct feedback of food and landscape. In Tuda Sudam, these agricultural scale interiors are conceived of as a space of complex on overlapping speciation, rather than singular production line monocrop. These interiors may contain outdoor spaces, yet they are bounded from forest reserves, marshes and wildlife corridors. Through Farmer, each site develops its own organizational logic and codependencies. Some contain recreation and therapeutic uses for humans. Just like Chef, Farmer needs humans to terraform. The sites are built and reshaped by administrators, who read Farmer's outputs. Farmer use intricate sensing apparatuses to log data ranging from soil pH and companion adjacencies to individual produce tracking. Farmer therefore understands food products very differently to how chef understand them, because chef is sensitive to human taste, texture and color. Over time, Chef and farmer develop correlational understandings of what things are to each other. They make their exchange in relative qualities of foodness and landscapeness. In a dialogue of requests, suggestion and rejection, farmer suggests new ingredients for chef, and chef suggests new arrangements for a farmer. Their separation is key. It introduces checks and balances of both sides of the experimentation. An ingredient that is not advantageous to a landscape will not be produced, nor will a landscape that is not palatable. If one rejects the suggestion of the other, the other must suggest again and again and again. They do not tire of this, their ability to cooperate is beyond any human institution.
When the human users select a dish, they are presented with the archive of the conversation that produces it. This becomes an ingredient list with condensed history beyond mere chemistry. As eating events are constructed around the dish by humans, their terraforming consequences are made immersive. In time and in space. The experimental tendencies of earth, ecologists and taste making are drawn even more in alignment. Bit by bit. Back and forth. Thank you for the interesting presentation. We continue again with another interesting story from Ivan Puzyryov from Russia and Thomas Grogan from the United Kingdom. And the title is Extended Reality, Extended Perception, Extended Animism. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ivan Puzyryov. Hi, my name is Thomas Grogan. Thank you for joining us uh, today at uh, Design Experience Challenges, um, events organized by University of Latvia. And uh, we are happy to welcome you in uh, virtual reality. Uh, I'm right now in uh, Moscow, and where are you, Thomas? I'm actually in London, in my living room. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> I'm in Stoke University in Moscow. So um, for, for, for people who is watching, uh, virtual reality session for the first time, uh, it's really important to mention that it's, it's exactly the way to speak about virtual reality to actually be presented in virtual reality, to show all these amazing possibilities of the future of virtual reality. Even the fact that we are all uh, standing in a different places in the world, including um, Alexei, who is a cameraman today, and uh, allowing to bring the, the people together um, Thomas, do you want to start uh, to speak about virtual reality um, from from beginning? <laughs> sure. I think uh, briefly before that, I think we might want to introduce ourselves and a bit of a background. Um, I'm oh, an yeah. artist Good, and yeah. design, <laughs> and I'm an artist and researcher, currently based in London, originally from France. And Ivan Prizirev is um, a VR developer. I mean, XR developer, <laughs> to be precise. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> and we both met at Strelke um, Institute in Moscow, developing a project called Tuda Suda with um, Paul Van Herk, who's an architect and writer, and Mila Savelieva, who's a photographer and based in Berlin. And um, we, uh, we, we've been invited by Andrea to present this project as, as also part of the conference. And uh, today we are presenting you also um, VR and XR possibilities with Ivan. Uh, Lucy and Paul will be presenting uh, to the Suda to you um, either before or later in the day. Um, and Ivan, do you want to start maybe introducing a bit of what VR, XR, AR, yeah. RR? Yeah, sure. R. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly the way I have a conversation with the people who is the first time meeting augmented and virtual reality. And uh, the best way to, to explain it is to really quickly understand that uh, it's all about the way people work 
use information, the people store information or people transfer information. So, it, for example, uh, one of the first media channels we all know uh, was a books, then uh, like a, a recording, um, a movie. Do you remember this movie, Thomas? Uh, it, it was a like a, a movie by Lumiere Brothers. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the train arriving in the station. Yeah, and uh, the fact that the people standing on on their seats and uh, <laughs> going out of the uh, of the hall because they were scared. Kind of the same thing I, I sometimes uh, can can observe on people trying a virtual reality for the first time. That's why I bring it <laughs> the kind of uh, uh, Swedish oh, three D train right here. So because that's exactly what happened with new media. So then it goes to radio, uh, a TV, uh, internet, mobile platform, social media. So the big question is what next? <laughs> what will be the way people share, people work with information? Where actually it will be stored? And one mm. of the answers that uh, the information should be should be kind of uh, overlaid with the physical world. And um, and to answer, what is it? What's the name of the tools and how to work with this digital layer? Uh, and the best way to, to to call it right now, it's a spatial computing. So technologies like augmented reality, like virtual reality, like extended reality, they're all together could be called a spatial computing. And, and when we want to work with this digital layer, like covering the physical space, uh, yes, we need to use these tools. So maybe you don't believe in virtual reality. Maybe you don't like augmented reality, but there are, for, for, for me, uh, and there are no other way to, for information to be represented in, in the future. And uh, that's why it's really important to mention that there are like big names in the art world who start exploring a virtual reality and augmented reality, start to experimenting with, um, with this new media. And for, for example, uh, like Marina Abramovich or Alfur Ellison or Chao Fei, uh, Jeff Koons, they all have been exploring uh, spatial computing and extended reality for more than uh, three. Some of them are working more than five years with this new media. And um, there are also some examples. Um, for example, uh, Ai Weiwei created a, a 360 video, 360 movie, trying to bring you uh, in, in inside the experience, or uh, um, uh, Alexander Iñárritu, the famous director, creates this experience like uh, three years ago, uh, showing, uh, allowing you to to be presented in a body of a soldier, and your, your, your food feel the sand, you, you feel the smell, you you're presented actually inside the, this environment, but a virtual reality just helps you visually to be uh, uh, displaced or or uh, Kind of be teleported in uh, conditions mm. where the director wanted you to, to be. I think what's important to underline about this idea that VR can create a, a new form of, of empathy. Sorry, I just jumped on you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Marina Abrimovic, in her work, kind of like underlines this. Um, her, her work about climate change, and then you arrive facing a kind of like iceberg who's um, slowly melting. And she's really willing to create some form of empathy towards uh, new contemporary challenges and how maybe VR can help rising sympathy towards people who are trying to create new incentives to help these, to counter these new uh, risks. And I think it's a bit what you were explaining with the, with the, with the train is um, there's a kind of like evolution of how immersed we are with one uh, me media and it's um, how much do we believe in it. Uh, and also we have uh, some examples of uh, um, projects by artists from UK. Uh, do you know some of them? Uh, Thomas, do you want to uh, say a few things about them? Yeah, I mean, there's only one from the UK is, uh, that is on this board is uh, Rochelle McLean as well creating this um, VR experience, um, which consists of um, you put a VR headset and then you have like people coming towards you and then by using the remote control, which is actually uh, a phone in virtual reality, you have to 
take pictures of people coming towards you and as soon as you take a picture of them they kind of like die so it's a bit like a zombie <laughs> video game but the um, the gun has been replaced by a phone taking pictures so i don't know there's something really interesting in how you can create new realities through a gameplay so it's no longer about like you telling a story but really inviting people to take part in a gameplay I think it's one of the greatest um, role of, of VR to be to be this media of uh, something which is which is not exist, but you you start believing when you're in, inside of this in, environment, and uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, remind me of these examples you sent me. Of this, it, it, it also could be called a virtual reality. People are not wearing uh, virtual reality glasses, but they are surrounded with a screen, so you can call it a kind of like a cave. A cave, cave, uh, cave system, um, and you f feel that you're kind of presented in the, in a completely different environment, and uh, even mm -hmm. the the ritual of of uh, <laughs> you should see how your hands look. It's it's yeah. amazing. It's 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 Am really I great. Waving? <laughs> so th th these are like um, restaurants by um, by um, French chef uh, uh, Pierre Perret. And then, so the, the, it's basically a bit like you, you argued with me that when I shared that with you, I was like, um, but this is not VR, but I understand the correlation. And you said, well, no, it's exactly like VR because by creating this, instead of like, you know, creating a vi virtual environment enclosed uh, around your eyes, it's enclosed around the room. So it's exactly the same process. And it's kind of like through his like experience of, of food eating and, and, and restaurant, He's willing to create a correlation between the ingredients and and what you see. So, like going beyond the olfactive sensor and with the visual sensor as well. Um, yeah. One of my uh, kind of uh, favorite thing, which is which is uh, impossible to, to do in a real world, but uh, extremely easy to do in a in a virtual reality. Is, is this kind of a search in a space? Do you remember this feature when you kind of uh, do like this and say Apple? <laughs> this and say Apple. Let's try again. One second. Are you Apple. Yeah. Here we are. And it's just I, I spent a, a second and he, here I get a kind of a 3D object and you can get one also. <laughs> And here is the one for for our. <laughs> it's a bit like having a genie, a, a genie, you know, and then you you get three wishes, but then here it's unlimited. Yeah, um, and uh, it's it's it, it, it's kind of um, it, it's kind of a, a way to to have a even a conversation. For example, right now we are in a in a application called uh, spatial it's one of the um, one of the many different one of the many social platforms so here's a, a short list of the existing social vr platforms where you all can meet it just it's not that complicated right now and uh, the fact that you can bring any objects you can bring any images you can dream you can even say it, it will it will become a, a physical object after you're saying this it's um, it, for me this is a this is the key feature of, of virtual reality. I think next we can we can speak a little bit about the uh, about the current uh, situation with virtual reality, uh, because for, for me all the works of the artists doing in a, in this new rising media um, really reflecting on what's going on on a, on a business part of the of the augmented virtual reality. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for example, one of the one of the uh, most interesting uh, chapter for virtual reality right now it's uh, how it works with the medicine and uh, w w what's uh, w what's the way to to work with your uh, with your self self perception uh, when we, when you have a like a mind sickness and uh, you need to to understand you need to speak with yourself for, for example mm. here I have a like a, a photogrammetry um, a copy of myself and uh, you just you can't imagine how strange I feel when I when when I come closer mm -hmm. to myself and I I just <laughs> I, I feel it, 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 it just I am imagining that if this person uh, starts speaking with me 
I definitely can can change my <laughs> can change uh, my perception of the of my even myself. And 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 mm. I just I want to again <laughs> make this strange thing that in virtual reality everything is possible, so we can have this huge sculpture <laughs> standing <laughs> right here. This is why there's a hole like a uh, <laughs> in, in the ceiling. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe Wait. let's put it somewhere. <laughs> um, I think we will make we will we will make the one for you, Thomas, for sure. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's kind of a. It, yeah. I, I just imagining that you will have a, a kids and you will show them. This is my first photogrammetry scan. It was made in a back in twenty twenty. Crazy year it was. Yes. <laughs> The first black and white. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say a few words about the, the current situation with uh, VR glasses. So here's a uh, wall of uh, coolness of VR glasses. <laughs> so all this is uncool right now. Uh, HTC Vive uh, Pro I is cool. Of uh, Facebook uh, owned Oculus. Just a quick reminder. So you can buy Oculus Quest or Oculus Quest 2. I, I will put it somewhere here in Sub Zero. But just, it's really important that you understand that uh, it's all this right now uh, using to to record your your behavior in virtual reality. But do you remember Thomas um, when we all together, you, Paul, and Lucy, we invent this, we start thinking about the Tuda Suda project and uh, what was the role for VR where, uh, in the beginning. Well, we were interested in, in seeing maybe the needs or like the potential of VR applying to um, more broader creative practices like uh, cooking or food food production and food uh, delivery system. A bit like what Pierre Perret did with his like restaurants is like maybe trying to innovate in the cooking industry uh, more vertically and uh, I mean, Lucy and Paul will talk a bit more about it, but we were interested in the ways that which um, maybe a VR platform could actually show you where food is coming from, as much as like the food products that you you get a bit like these dishes. So creating a correlation between the two, and it's interesting because since we developed our project, we're seeing more and more use of VR in like um experimental way and maybe you want to talk a bit about that project which i found is relates quite well with our research project uh yeah just um, one of the game um you you can all play in um Ocul in oculus or any virtual reality glasses where you kind of in it's kind of imitating the cooking process so you are chief and you're collaborating with others in virtual reality. So you're just standing as this person at, at, at your home and uh, just participating in this in this process virtually. But, but uh, what, what is most important, what I, I just uh, I remember when we uh, start speaking about Tuda Suda and the reason why we um, apply this virtual reality interface is that the fact that, um, for example, in virtual reality, you can control things just by uh, gaze, gaze tracking, or you can understand the user behavior based on what's his gesture. And what, what, you, just, you can get much more information when yeah. you have a user inside the virtual reality. So it's, it's kind of a, one, of the, one of the most advanced interface could be presented in, in, in virtual reality, because as you all know and understand this, everything is possible in virtual reality. And it could be the okay, environment can change in a second, and uh, like your actions could be tracked, but it's really, really yeah. important to understand how you actually using this data. Because uh, for example, the Facebook using it for, for advertising. So our plan were more, uh, my plans were more related to a target of the Tuda Suda project itself. Yeah, I think it's important to underline the fact or the potential of your, like exploring uh, communication, not only in text and audio, but also happening in like, uh, facial gestures and um, body gestures. And I think if you understand that this are elements of communication that are really important, then you can see the immense potential of using VR in any form of creative practices from, you know, cooking to, um, to the arts 
or do design and to brainstorming, you know. Yeah, or uh, when you mention when you mentioned this, I just remember also this project where they add a, a smell mask, uh, kind of a mask which imitates a smell in a virtual reality. So mm. it's just a kind of adding a more layers to of of uh, representing the sensitive experience for human, like mimics, uh, brain interface, and 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 smell. Should we um, or, stop wrapping up because I'm aware of time, and then uh, yeah. open up to Q and A's? Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to go to this part? Um, yes, sure. One of the really important things which is going right now between uh, relationship, uh, like in the relationship between users, platform companies like uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, or like a smaller one like a Snap, and um, and, and, and society and uh, in, in society and users in general is that the fact that uh, in last six months they are all present they they all have the same idea in their presentation they are not highlighted and there are not lots of like news about it but you just can see this uh, kind of how they are related between each other so let's start let's start from uh, from this short video by Apple. So it's a part of their presentation where they're saying that we are looking for a point cloud of the city. So can you provide us a point cloud as a user so we can create a, a, like a digital copy of the city where you can, where we can uh, put the, like virtual reality or virtual reality objects. Or here's a presentation, a short presentation by Facebook, kind of saying the same. Just give us a possibility to track your uh, actions and uh, track your environment around you or here's a short video you already can get this aesthetic of the point cloud and they're all speaking the same this is a project by snapchat and the last one is a google and they're all uh, using the same idea mm. so i'm calling this kind of a, a point cloud battle <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's it's pretty important that um, uh, the big companies big tech companies uh, already kind of start uh, competing of the on, on this um, the future media and uh it's important for users to to understand that there should, there should be a different regulations and um, different rules and different a completely different way to communicate with these layers and uh, that's why it's really important to to have more artists uh, who are exploring and the designers who are exploring this new media because it, it's become uh, a kind of inspiration for uh, engineers and uh, who be people who are doing different uh, AR and VR projects. Great. And uh, I think that's a yeah. good way of like ending and seeing all the potential. Because once we have like a, a, a fully virtual version of our own world, then because of its 3D scanning, then you can imagine like easily like adding on digital elements. Um, that's great. I mean, let's jump to um, the Q&A. And uh, well, we'll see you there. I mean, see you in two dimensions. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you for the interesting presentation. And if uh, uh, there are any questions and um, suggestions, let us use the live chat, uh, YouTube chat. And uh, we go on and um, round up our conference with uh, Sergei Kulinkovic from Russia with um, his presentation, Nikolai Ironov. The story behind the birth of the artificial graphic designer. Hello, everyone. My name is Sergei Kulinkovich, and I'm the art director of Nikolai Ironov Project. And uh, today I'm very excited to tell you the story behind the creation of this thing and share some insights. So let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Sergei Kulinkovich and I'm the art director of Nikolai Ironov Project. And uh, today I'm very excited to tell you the story behind the creation of this thing and share some insights. So let's get started. Nikolai Ironov. I've never seen the studio. Никто ничего не знал о нем. 
Что за чувак? Его заметили, когда он начал делать логотипы. Иронов не оставлял равнодушных. Что это? Мы еще не доросли до этого логотипа. Это какие-то символы, которые они во мне увидели, бы типа они сюда выдали так. Это мое лицо! Это мо... Посмотрите! Нет ни малейшего шанса, что это просто совпадение. Это все начало нового пути. Его работы запускали в производство. Это все говорит то, что это живет уже на вывес, на упаковке. Другие дизайнеры стали копировать его. Когда через несколько лет ты будешь смотреть и видеть, как трансформируется норма. Важное событие в мире дизайна. Наш дизайнер Николай Иронов справился блестяще с этой задачей. Николай Иронов — это не человек. Мы создали искусственный дизайнерский интеллект. Он может создать бесконечное количество логотипов, и все, что тебе нужно сделать, выбрать идеально. Способ делать быстро, много и разнообразно. Он создает совершенно много. Он не боится критики. Получается что-то, что не думает так, как человек. Эта комбинация компонентов создает такой диапазон, который ни один живой человек не может покрыть. Даже я уже часто не понимаю, как именно он думает. Все уже произошло, это уже на улицах. We've been designing things for years, and we have a huge experience in different design areas. So graphic design and branding are definitely one of our main points of interest at the moment. Back in the days, it all started with website development. So historically, we have a strong background in tech. We've been combining design and tech widely. For example, Instead of designing just one version of the periodic table, we created thousands. Technology has allowed us to do this. But all these years, we've been using technology more in a supporting, secondary role. And um, at some point we thought, what if we made technology the basis for creativity, the source for original image creation? So we started our research and uh, we experimented a lot with different image creation technologies, including various neural networks and algorithms. And eventually we found that using isolated neural networks in most cases doesn't lead to sufficiently diverse results uh, that can be applied to real design tasks. We saw how hundreds of logos were created, how the teamwork process goes on, and uh, this allowed us to see some patterns, things that are repeated over and over again during the creative workflow. So instead of building just one technology, we decided to build a bunch of tiny design automation tools and later combine them into one system. And that was the moment when Ironov was born. We were guided by our vision on how the process of creation the successful brand identity should be built. And that was the aha moment. So the real power of neural network technology in solving the real design tasks is revealed when neural networks are combined with each other and the results are enriched with algorithms. So we used combination of neural networks and algorithms to create fresh looking and unique design pieces. So this approach offered 
an unlimited number of fresh perspectives. So our system came up with fascinating and sometimes really unexpected results. So eventually we've built a product to handle every stage of graphic design process. Essentially, Nikolai Ronov's brain is a combination of different design automation algorithms that uh, serve different stages of the design process. And we understand that this is just the beginning, like the minimum viable product. So it turned out that the thing we call creativity, in many cases, is just about complexity. And uh, if you spend enough time just researching and isolating each of the creativity components, you will eventually find out how this magic works. It also became clear that um, what a human creative spends most of his time on can be automated effectively. So this creates the opportunities to free designer from the routine which used to be an integral part of creative process before. So we've tested our technology on over 20 real commercial projects, creating everything from beer bottles, labels to startup logos. And it is interesting that many clients were absolutely satisfied with the results and they actually put that design on their real products. And that proved that our approach is viable, that artificial design developed by a machine is now at a stage where it can be put on real products in real world and uh, can be loved by clients and not only by clients, but by the end brand consumers. We want to push the limits of what is called normal. And uh, we aim to create things that will require some extra space in people's minds. So Nikolai Ronov is an excellent tool uh, for finding you in design. You just set some boundaries and let it do whatever it wants. So creating something new in graphic design is quite uh, a challenging task. And even if you remove all the restrictions, uh, the designer will still offer some stereotypical um, design solutions one way or another. And uh, designers have a great affinity to uh, their style, which they developed over the years. And uh, going beyond this style is uh, not as easy as it seems at first sight. Sometimes designers are afraid to even think of something that falls out of uh, understanding the norm. The second important point is that creating something new requires some efforts. In order to simply check how this or that solution will look like, the designer needs to spend a certain amount of time and energy to create a sketch. As a result, designer often makes a choice in favor of familiar solutions with predictable efficiency to save time and energy. So this greatly limits the potential range of uh, solutions available to a human designer. And Ironov solves this problem uh, by providing the opportunity to test tons of uh, various design options in seconds. When our clients found out that their projects were implemented by a machine, uh, this caused a positive feedback. It turned out that people were ready for the future. And uh, business needs result, not the process. And uh, if the machine is able to create a decent design, so why not? Moreover, there were clients who began giving preference to Ironov instead of human designers. And uh, people started to find advantages in the design created by machine. But we went even further. We created a service 
that hundreds of people nowadays use to solve their own design problems without our direct involvement. In fact, we have uh, converted our expertise uh, in design into a product. And uh, now people have access to our expertise and uh, our personal time is no longer a bottleneck. Today, users can experience seeing a brief transformed into a unique corporate identity within seconds, right in front of their eyes. This story is also about democratizing design. If you want your brand to stand out in the era of startups, personal branding and micro businesses, so you need to look for original, bold, contrasting graphic design solutions. And uh, this search often turns into a long and expensive experience. So we aim to democratize design by reducing the cost while delivering the same or in some cases even better results. So the launch of this project initiated like an endless discussions on the future of design profession and many creatives were afraid that they might lose their job in future. And uh, I received a lot of messages from designers asking what they should do now. With the development of such tools, um, people will have more time to discover their inner creative potential and uh, do what only human being can do so far. New technologies may require some uh, changes in design education. I expect shift from focusing on basic design uh, skills to learning how to build and manage complicated systems that are able to produce desired results. Unlike his human co-workers, Aronov can work 24 hours a day never gets sick and uh, never suffers from artistic blocks. However, we do not seek to remove people from the creative process entirely, but instead to shift them from being designers to art directors. And uh, the ability to choose becomes more important than uh, the ability to create. Today, technology allows you to do amazing things. The main challenge is to find the right combination of technology, data, and uh, context. It is only a matter of time before such systems will take their place in other creative industries. So, thank you so much for having me, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, every, every participant, every person involved in this conference. So our conference, Design, Experience and Challenge 2020, has come to an end. Um, listening to you, dear speakers, uh, we see that the impossible comes possible. And this is because of you. You are the asset of our conference. Thank you again. Um, we also thank the uh, scientific committee of the conference and the organizing committee of the conference, headed by Andra Irbite, and Latvian Designers Society, University of Latvia, the uh, partners Nebetia, and the Faculty of Education, Psychology and Art. Thank you, everybody, and see you again at our next conference. Stay safe and well. Goodbye. <laughs>